Good morning. The court will call State of Wisconsin versus Jesse Kershevsky. 21 CF885 may have the appearances, please. Good morning, Judge Abby Nikolai, Randy Sitzberger, and JJ Crawford appearing on behalf of the state. Donna Kukler, Pablo Galavis appear with Ms. Kershevsky. Good morning. All right, is there anything uh, we need to address prior to bringing the jury in? I am advised they are all here. From, From the, state? the state? Thank well, you. Yes, uh, thank you. I'm, as I indicated to the court, just uh, casually, Attorney Navreski is going to assist me this morning, and I'm not sure if he's having trouble at security or what. But Do you I, want me to wait for him? I would really appreciate it. No if problem. We could wait five or ten minutes till he gets here and helps me get. I know you brought him in for the technology, yes. and so uh, I certainly can uh, honor that request. We all know it takes a little bit of time, and he is walking in right now. In the, this courtroom? He is. Oh, okay, good. <laughs> Thank you. Welcome. Record should reflect that we do have Attorney Brad Navreski also present, who will be assisting the defense today. Could we have five, or five minutes or so? We can have a couple minutes, yes. Couple we'll be minutes. off the record. All right, thank you. Okay. I'm going to turn the microphones off.
please remain standing. The jury will be in shortly. By the way, I'll introduce Attorney Navrusky as well. Thanks. Oh, we do. I will um, swear Dr. Vidzritsky in today as again. I always do that on day two if they happen to still be with us. Thank you, everyone. Please be seated. And good morning, <laughs> ladies and gentlemen of the jury. I wanted to advise you that uh, attorney, attorneys Kukler and Galavis are being assisted today by attorney Brad Nareski. If you want to just stand up and wave so that you know who that is. And uh, doctor, uh, if you would please stand. It is day two of your testimony, so I'm going to have you resworn. Madam Clerk. Do you solemnly swear that the testimony you're about to give shall be the truth and will truth be nothing but the truth, so help you God? I do. Thank you. Please have a seat. And then, Attorney Kukler, you may start your cross. Thank you. You said yesterday that uh, you had a deputy medical examiner who went to the scene for your eyes and your ears. Is that right? Yes. And she doesn't work for you any longer? Correct. You, you also indicated that you have um, two and a half pathologists working at your office? Um, two and a little less than a half. Was that the same in 2018? 2018? No, three full time. Attorney Kukler, if you'd like to have <clears throat> a lapel mic, I'll give you some more freedom then. And then we'll make sure we all hear you. Everything that I have available, yes. And that included in this case uh, things that were observed at the scene. True. Police reports. True. You also looked at Lynn yourself, her body. Absolutely. You made observations of the outside of her body. Yes. You told us about that yesterday. Yes. Things that you saw on her that you thought looked a little funny. Yes. And then you ultimately did an autopsy where you um, looked in the inside of her body. That's right. And you also had lab, labs run. Yes. And that's standard. Yes. So did you, um, and you only use NMS labs here. Yes. You sent, the, you sent blood samples and um, stomach contents. Yes. To that lab. Yes. Did you send it initially with any particular instructions on what to run or just the standard? I did have particular instructions. Um, 
because I know, I re as I recall, and it would be listed on the report, baclofen would not be part of the usual screen. So besides asking for their expanded screen, I said specifically look for baclofen. There might, have, there might be other examples like that. I would have to look at the report. Did you go through every one of the uh, medications that you knew were at Lynn's home and ask that all of those be checked on the, uh, when they did their labs? I did not ask for um, a Nexium level, for okay. example. And you had all, all, the, all the pill bottles from, from Lynn's, uh, Lynn's home. You, you had those in your possession. Yes. Did you bring those with you so we can see them? No, and I, I'm sorry because they are in my office. I did retrieve them in case we needed them in court so we could get them pretty fast if you wanted. Okay, um, and we can because your office is really like kitty corner from here, right? Correct. Uh, the way this courthouse is set up is we're on this floor. Is We're under some construction, right? Yes. But uh, if that wall wasn't closed off outside of this courtroom, you'd just walk down the hallway and you'd be at the district attorney's office. Objection and she may answer. Is that uh, true? The DA's office is connected usually if there was no construction to this building. Yes. And it's still in this building, the district attorney's office, true? It's in the courthouse. <clears throat> okay. If, yes. The build, well, the administration building, the court tower, and the courthouse are all connected. I, don't, I mean, I think facilities call them separate buildings, but they're all connected. And then if you go out behind you, where you are sitting. If we went out of the building on that side, there's a parking lot, true? True. Mm -hmm. And on the jury side of that parking lot, that's the sheriff's department. You know, I'm not sure about the jury side part, but the sheriff's department is in another building near the parking lot, so I'd agree with that. Okay, so we have a parking lot in back, and on, on the north side of the parking lot is the courthouse, and on, I think, what would, do I have that right, is the north side of yes, that lot? Yes, yes, yes. Okay, and then on the other side of the parking lot is the sheriff's department. Correct. And that's a building you work in. I'm in that building, correct. There's only two people, two agencies in that building, that's the sheriff's and the medical examiner. Right. You share the same door to come into the building. Yes. And the same elevator and so on. Yes. Okay. So you're part of this whole complex? Yes. So you, on the day of, the, of Lynn's death, you sent a deputy medical examiner over to the home? Yes. Because you can't go to all the scenes? Correct. But you rely upon what she uh, notices there to help you uh, make your ultimate conclusions. That's true. So I, am I, would I be correct that you looked at all the photographs she took? Yes. Carefully? Yes. And then um, you, did you compare them to uh, the photographs that you took? Um, in the autopsy room? Right. I didn't compare them per se, no. Okay. And you said that <laughs> The deputy medical examiner has been very carefully trained. True. True. You're you're very particular in your office. True. You want to do things very carefully. We try. And one of those things is to make sure that the body isn't moved. Well, is is kept in the same position so that you can see it when it gets back to your office, the way it was found at the scene as best as possible. I wouldn't say the body in the same position because transport requires the body to be put on a cot. So if somebody's sitting, they're not sitting when they're transported. But I think I alluded to the fact that the clothing should be as disrupted as minimally as possible. In other words, if the pants are down, they're not pulled up. So if, so if somebody's sitting in a chair, which yes. Lynn was, right? Lynn yes. Was, Lynn was found sitting in a chair. Yes. And she was found with... Um, some what looks like uh, medic medication crushed up on, on her little bit in her mouth and some on her upper chest, right? That's true. And then your deputy medical examiner would have had to take that body out of the chair, lay her down, right? Yes. Put her in a body bag, true? True. 
because the picture you showed us yesterday of the of the jacket and the close up of the jacket at your office, I think I could see behind uh, Lynn what looked like a body bag. Yes. Okay, because that's how they transport the body to you. Correct. And obviously the body moves and medication that can be on somebody can, can move its position. Wouldn't you agree? That's true. Because we know that if we have some kind of powder on us, if we change positions, it's going gonna, it's gonna to move around. True. So how it was at your office isn't necessarily exactly representative of how it was at the scene. Correct. And I want to show you some of those scene photos. Okay. So I want to go through the scene photos and, and <coughs> one by one, and some will move through faster and some not. This has already been admitted as our exhibit. Do we know what number? 543. Yes, we're going to publish. And we'll wait to see when the jury puts it up on their screens. And it's not on the district attorney screen, Madam Clerk. I can see. Okay, we're set to go. Well, there's been some disagreement maybe on, um, on who took this particular photo, but I, I see somebody holding it with blue gloves. Yes. Would, that, would your deputy medical examiner be holding blue, or wearing blue gloves probably? Um, the deputy medical examiners can wear any type of glove they want. I mean, we have nitro, we have latex, we have vinyl. So I, I couldn't say just by the color of the gloves. Better question would be, would she be wearing gloves? I would, I would say yes. Okay. And uh, page two, that's how Lynn was see, uh, found at the scene, right? Yes. And you studied this picture before? Yes. Can you see to Lynn's left the little table where there is a bottle of what looks like eye drops. It's a bottle. I don't know what kind. what's in the bottle. Can you compare it with this eye drop and see if this looks like the same, or do you need a closer up picture? Could I please see that? <coughs> Same exhibit, page eight. I see. You see? Yes. Um, so we've gone out and bought what we can see on the table and compared it. May I show you this yes. item? Go ahead. Thank you, Judge. coloring on the front and see if that matches. It looks like it matches. Okay. So these are called Theratiers, right? Yes. At the bottom it says for dry eye therapy. Yes. And although you were minimizing uh, Lynn's eye problems yesterday, um, fact, she did have a history of dry eyes. Yes. And eye pain. I don't recall the pain. I recall her saying she had dry eyes. Okay, well, we'll get to that when we get to her medical records. So, even though you said yesterday, I thought I heard you say that there were no eye drops found at the scene. I'm being asked a question by uh, the district attorney, were there eye drops at the scene? You said no. You didn't notice those eye drops, true? True. Okay. And nobody at the scene was really going around looking for eye drops because that, 
at least if, if I told you that the people who have, uh, were first responders at the scene weren't paying attention to eye drops, would, would that surprise you? No. Because when you sent your deputy medical examiner to the scene, you didn't say, look for eye drops. True. Okay. Page nine of the same exhibit. Is that nine? Mm -hmm. Those are bottles of prescriptions that were at the scene? Yes. You, um, you've recovered those? You have those in your possession? I believe so. I mean, I would have to compare the ones in my possession to the photo, but I believe so. And if we take a break later, maybe you could bring, have somebody bring those over? Sure. Okay, that would be great. Um, Number eight. And then you can see that Lynn was definitely, would appear anyway, that she was, smoke, she was a smoker. True. And did you look to see whether you could see any lipstick on any of the cigarette butts? I, I did not, no. Okay. You talked yesterday, you were asked if there was blood on her mouth, and you said there wasn't blood on her, right? Correct. Um, if you <clears throat> did you notice in the hospital records that she was eating red popsicles? Do you think that that could be dye from red popsicles? I don't remember that from the hospital records, but it does seem like it looks like food coloring, which may be from red popsicles. Okay. There's a plate of substance that was at the scene. Have you seen this before? Yes. This substance wasn't tested, was it? No. So we really don't know what it was. No. Was it when you said you sent substance in to be tested, was that just what you found on Lynn's um, chest area? Correct. That's the only loose substance that was tested? Correct. And what was on the floor there that wasn't tested? It was recovered, the, not the fragments. The pills themselves were recovered. And you have those pills in your possession? Yes. But the fragments on the floor, those weren't tested? No. You didn't instruct your deputy medical examiner to gather this, uh, these substances so they could be tested? Uh, there was no opportunity because this, um, I only became aware of the case after the case after Lynn was in my um, custody. In other words, I had no contact during the uh, investigation at the scene with my staff. So she didn't call you and ask for advice? No. Did she contact any of the other, of the two uh, full-time medical examiners for advice, if you know? No, not that I know of. She's pretty independent. Correct. It would be nice to have that substance, but we don't. We don't. Is that a closer up view? We're looking at picture 14? Yes. You saved those pills? Yes. 16? Fifteen. This is picture 15. Do you know what the significance of this is? Why the picture of the... Is that a poop in the toilet? I can't say that it's just dark because it's the end of, you know, the base of the toilet or if there's a substance in it. I can't tell. Looks like there's a special toilet seat put on top of the regular toilet, doesn't it? If you look above, can't you see that the normal toilet seat yes. is, being, is up like it's, a man might put it up, for example? Yes. And then there's another seat on top of the toilet, right? Correct. And you've seen those before for people who have trouble getting down on a toilet, they might have higher seats, right? That's true. Is that what that looks like? It does. Did you, um, was there any significance to this photo in your mind? In terms of being negative? I mean, sometimes my staff look at the toilet to see if there's vomit, urine, or, you know, excrement in it. I, it seems to be part of their routine 
examination. So it could, it's maybe significance in its lack of showing anything specific. This picture, which is number 19 of Exhibit 543, is a photograph also taken by your medical uh, assistant, assistant medical examiner <clears throat> of a checkbook ledger. True. Yes. <clears throat> Indicating that Jesse can always be reached. <clears throat> yes. And indicating that it's a mother-daughter between Jennifer, Jenny Flowers and <clears throat> Jesse Krzyzewski, right? You see that? I see Jenny Flowers, um, the arrow, mother-daughter. Do you, you know, because you've been working on this case, that that is a mother-daughter? I am aware. Right, because you've read the police reports. Yes. You know that Jenny is Jesse's mother. Yes. And then there's people that are third and fourth on there, right? Yes. No. And you read this, you've seen this, this um, photograph. Yes. This was not preserved. No. But you can see, at the, you've read it. Yes. It appears to have been written by Lynn uh, on 926 of 2015, right? Yes. And she indicates at the top that she's uh, of sound mind, and then she even signs her signature up there at the top, right? Yes. Doesn't it appear to be instructions if she's in the hospital for what people, if she's in the hospital or otherwise incapacitated for what people should do in her home? Yes. Like for example, um, uh, if you walk out after ni uh, at night, make sure you have the keypad with you, right? Yes. Uh, in information about where the blankets are in my bedroom yes. closet. Yes. Leave the TV on for the cats. Yes. Don't touch antennas. Yes. It's a lot of instructions, and as you go down a little bit further, can we bring that down a little bit? Um, I see 2629281000, I happen to know to be the, the Waukesha Memorial Hospital number. Do you know that, too? <clears throat> no. Okay. It's just because I remember numbers. We can't see. Okay, we'll bring up 21. Is that way to come out of can you see it close? Is it close enough for you to be able to see yes. that number? Yes. And it does say desk at hospital, right? Yes. And they'll connect you with my room. Yes. And other instructions were on the next page. What, what, what Jesse or what Lynn wanted wanted done, right? You've gone through all that. I did read this. And on on picture twenty three, do you see? Where it says uh, Keith, Jim, and Kareen, they don't need to come over here. It's over. Do you, do you see that by their names? I'm looking. Do you see their names in the middle of the page? With their phone numbers? I see. Do you look yes. to the left? I see. Telling them they don't need, telling whoever reads this note, they don't need to come over. Correct. show you a, a few pictures from your autopsy. Judge, a couple of these are going to be graphic. All right, thank you for the heads up on More that. I appreciate it. What we've seen so far. Right. 
have not been published yet, so I'll need to show them to the witness. What uh, exhibit number is this? This is our exhibit. I don't know if they've been admitted yet. So. They haven't. Not these. Just give me a second while I grab my copy. Okay. You said 542? Yes. Thank you. All right, I have them. Thank you. Can the witness see what's on the screen right now, Judge? She cannot yet, but we're, we'll publish to the witness. I'm just going to show you, before we show the jury, <clears throat> four photos that, um, here's photo one, photo two, photo three, photo four. Okay. Do you recognize those photos? Yes. Okay, to the first one. Did you take those photos? No. Or someone in your direction took them? Yes. When you do an autopsy, you have somebody assisting you? Correct. Um, like a technician of some sort? Yes. Who's taking photographs that you direct? That's true. And so uh, that's what the, that's, these are the photographs, though, from your autopsy of Lynn Hernan, true? True. Okay. So uh, move for admission of 542. No objection. Thank you. Exhibit 542 is received. Permission to publish? Granted. All right. Okay, so I'm going to start with the picture one of 542. Is that Lynn's, is that Lynn's foot, right? Correct. And you can see that um, her toenails are not very well cared for. The cuticles are, are in pretty rough shape, right? Kind of a judgment call. I mean, in my work, her toes look pretty average. Not, they're not the kind of toes that I would say these are um, poorly cared for. So, I, I mean, it's a judgment call. People can make their own opinions. And if she has somebody helping her, like Jessie, um, you think Jessie did a pretty good job of polishing those toenails? Um, they look like they were done a while ago because there's some outgrowth, but she was in the hospital, so. But, you know, not bad, no. Okay. Now, the next picture is a little graphic, um, but I would ask for photo two to be shown. Now, this is a couple of pills that were found undissolved inside of Lynn, right? Correct. And uh, is this her stomach? It is. Did you save those pills? I did. Did you test those pills? No. Next photo three. Is that the same two pills? Correct. Close up view? Yes. They look like they're starting to dissolve? True. Some of the, the coloring is off of it? Well, they're opened up. Their contents are coming out. Do you know what these pills are? They look like nifedipine. And we, we, you've testified at a hearing in this matter previously, right? Yes. And that was something that was brought up with you at that hearing, right? Yes. And you didn't know at that time whether they were? Um, no, but I did look at the color and the inscription, and they're consistent with nifedipine. So when we mentioned, do you look at the number 30 on it, right? Yes. And you can see the 30 on it. Yes. You then did some research after the fact. Yes. And, that, and when we mentioned that to you, that was in December, this past December, December of 20, 2022. I don't know the day. It was, a, it was in 2022, though, correct? I, I really don't remember when this occurred. All right. Uh, so after we told you about the number 30 and we thought it was an ephedrine, you looked it up and it seems to be. True. Uh, photo number four. Now, this is this is not inside of Lynn's body, right? Correct. These are a picture of five pills. Correct. And these five pills were found. You found them in her stomach, right? No. 
three, uh, some you found in her stomach. Yes. Tell us which pictures you found, uh, what pills you found where. The three top ones that are orange were in her stomach. You saw two of them before, and then I saw another one after the first picture was taken. And the two on the bottom that are yellow were found in her colon. Okay, so she had at least five pills in her. Yes. And you, you've never, you never tested these pills? No. The ones on the bottom, have you been able to identify them since the last time we met? No. Would you agree that those bottom two pills look like they've start, started some sort of process of um, dissolving? Um, may I refer to my autopsy report to see how I describe them? Um, I'm just asking you, if, as you look at them now, do they appear to have started to dissolve? They look changed from the GI tract. Whether they're dissolved or not, I can't say, but I do recall making a comment about them in my autopsy report. If they're changed, well, so what happens with a pill? Pill, go, You take a pill, and then it starts to, it goes into your stomach, right? Yes. And then it starts to dissolve? Sometimes. And then does it go into your intestines? It may. And then into your blood? Well, it, yes. Eventually, the point of taking the pills is that it eventually goes into your blood. But the pathway for digestion depends on, depends on the composition of the pill. Extended release pills are made to be released through a longer course through your GI tract, for example, and their outer coating is um, not made to dissolve in the stomach, which is why it's not common to find pills in the colon, which is at the end of your GI tract, and they're often only shells of the pills, which means that there's no active product in them. Other pills are designed to completely dissolve in your stomach. Um, I would say most aspirins are, but then you can find other aspirins that have a coating. So it depends on the medication, where, how it's designed to um, be absorbed by your system and at what part of the tract over what time course. So I can't agree on um, something that would cover all those possibilities. All right. Well, the two that are found in the colon, yes. those could be the shells. Yes, the correct. They're ready to be discharged. It could through, be. Through a bowel movement, right? True. Because shells can do that. True. All right. So if that was the case, then probably those pills, that whatever active ingredient was in those pills has already been part of the bloodstream. It could be, yes. And as to the three that are on the top, the nephedoprine. Yes. Uh, now those are a, uh, a slow-acting pill, aren't they? Oh, I don't know. You're not a toxicologist. Well, I don't know this particular preparation. I'm sure there's multiple preparations of nifedipine by different manufacturers. You don't know whether... Do you, would you agree that a nifedipine pill is difficult to crush? I don't know. You don't really know the makeup of the pills themselves? The particular compounding or how crushable they are? No, I can't tell you. All right. Done with that. You, yesterday, you showed us photos from the, uh, the autopsy, and you showed a photo of Lynn laying on your table with, with the autopsy, or with the, the, with the bag uh, behind her. Do you remember that photo yesterday? I do. And then this morning, we've shown you a photo from the scene of of Lynn, how she was found when your deputy medical examiner got there. Yes. What I want to show you now is I put those two photos side by side, and I'd like to display them for you so that you can, because you said you didn't have time to compare them, so um, I'm going to let you compare them now. I'm going to use, I've given this a new exhibit number, Your Honor, 585. And that's going to just be a comparison of, two, of some photos. I can see that the photo on the left is exhibit 40. Do you know what number the other one is? Uh, yes. 
is the 543 page 4 and it's a close up it's the close up and I would agree that both of those exhibits have already been received Before I show you those, I just want to ask one follow-up question about those pills. Did you throw those pills out? What pills? Those five pills that were inside of Jesse. Yes, they were disposed of. Oh, I'm sorry, that's yes. inside Lynn, yes, of yes. course. Yes, they were uh, discarded after our per our retention policy. So they're thrown, well, you don't, you keep, when a case is open and active, you don't throw things, evidence away as a general rule, do you? After the case was signed out, the, um, our retention policy is to hold it for a year. Cases are signed out within a year. And you signed this case out? Yes. And so then you threw those away? Correct. But you did save the bottles? Yes. Even though your retention pol policy is just a year? We were late on that, yes. What's that? We were late on throwing those away, yes. So because you threw the pills away, then they're not, they, were, they were never available for... Uh, defense to test, true? That's true. All right. Now I want to show you this new exhibit, <coughs> which we've labeled 585, and we'd like to publish it. Any objection? No. All right, go ahead. So exhibit 585 is received, and then you're publishing it. Thank you. Sure, I'll get a thumbs up when people can see it. You see 585? Yes. The picture as you're looking at it, uh, as you're looking at on your, uh, you see Lynn on your left at the scene, or on, on your right. Correct, on my right. And on your and on your left is Lynn at your office. True. All right. So now you said that yesterday all this. Uh, material from the pills um, was sprinkled all over her and and you showed some things yesterday for example Lynn at your office you're showing uh, powder or pills right up by her neck but you don't see that on the scene I'm sorry I don't see it on the scene yeah on the scene neck. photo it's Is on it? It's on her upper chest. It's right. A, yes. And you can see that the, you know that she had dog tags on. Yes. And you can see that the dog tags at the scene, you can't even see the, um, the dog tags, right? They're, they're inside of her, her blouse. True. And the chain is coming straight down. Yes. But at your office, the chain is across her neck. Correct. So it's moved. Yes. So the chain obviously is right on top of, of pill debris and it moved in the process of moving her body. True. Even when it comes to, well what, you, you, you said that there was a pill debris in her hair. Yes. What, the people who testified from the scene Including, including the med, uh, the deputy medical examiner. She's not a doctor, though, right? Correct. Okay. Um, they didn't see any pills in her hair. 
Now, you'd agree that her position was changed from when she was at the scene in this recliner to when she was taken out of the recliner, put down on a, was she put on a stretcher probably? It's called a cot. A cot. So she, there's a body bag on the cot? Yes. And then she is lifted with the help of a couple people probably, right? Probably. She, she weighed, what did she weigh when you autopsied her? I would have to look at my report. She was heavy. I would have to look at my report. All right, you don't remember <clears throat> you sit here no, today? No, no. And then put, she was lifted by a couple people and put in the body bag on the cot, right? Yes. And then wheeled out to the medical examiner SUV? Yes. And then loaded in there? Correct. And then brought, back, brought to the offices right over here? Yes. Uh, it, would, she, would she have been brought in through the garage? Yes. And then transported in the elevator up to your floor? No, no elevator. Oh, okay. Do you keep the, use the ground floor for your autopsies? Yes. So wheeled into the autopsy room? Yes. Put in the refrigerator? Yes. And, uh, well, taken off of the cart, the cot, or would she have been left on the cot? From the cot, they're trans uh, the people are transferred to the autopsy table directly. So is that what happened with Lynn? Yes. She was moved from the, the cot to the autopsy table? Right. And then what happened to her body? And then she was... In the refrigerator? Correct. And then she sat in there until you got around to doing the autopsy? True. And then that table is wheeled out of the refrigerator? Yes. And then you started to work on her? Correct. We have another exhibit, another page of this exhibit. This is a... Still part of 585, just yes. another page, so page two. Page two. You should be up in front of the witness momentarily. So we don't have a copy of this multi-page exhibit. Can I just take a look at all the pages of it? They're all photos from that have been introduced already. Sure. Here, take it off publish for a second. If you could just show them on your screen. Attorney Nicolai can walk over and just look. How many pages is it total? Four. Thank you. We've shown uh, the four photos to um, the district attorney's office. Thank now you. we're just for the record, so it's clear. Will you make sure you tell us? I know it's from what I saw. It's still page three of five forty-three compared to other photos. Just remind us what those exhibits. I know it's on there, but just remind us. going to compare photo, um, States Exhibit 41 to Defense Exhibit 543, page 4. Here we go. I don't have an objection to Exhibit 585. Thank you. All right. Uh, see again the comparison between the photo from your office on the left and from the scene on the right? Correct. By the way, that blue um, medical device that's on Lynn's left shoulder, that's from when she was in the hospital, isn't that right? No. Oh, what's that from, the scene? EMS. EMS, okay. Now, see how your dog tags are moved at your office way to the side? Yes. So clearly, there's been some manipulation. 
of this area around her chest between when she was found at the scene and arrived at your office. Yes. Agree? Yes. Next exhibit, which is going to be five. It's going to be uh, <coughs> 14. 42 and 543 page four still. The one on the left, you, you took the photo yeah. on the left well, it was your take, office? Yes. At the medical examiner's office? Yes. The one on the right at the scene? Correct. Same one we've been looking at on the right? Yes. You showed this one. Uh, you can see uh, that uh, they're here. Uh, well, first of all, you can see the dog tag is moved. Yes. It looks to be on the left side of her jaw or kind of the top of her neck now? Yes. And on that's at your office and at the scene, it was straight down uh, by her into the breast area? Yes. You can't see the dog tags? No. And the glasses seem to be have been uh, moved back a little bit further? The hair is up higher? Yes. Okay. The last one. One more. This is uh, 40, 44 and 543, photo 4 still. You said that, that the pills had gone all the way down. You were showing how they were sprinkled all over her and show that photo that's on our left. But you can see it's not the same as the pill fragments were at the scene. Not, not exactly the same. Not exactly. Pill fragments seem to be uh, coming down. There's more on your photo in more of a straight line even. Do you see that? Yes. And so clearly the substance is traveling in some fashion. Yes. And even at the scene, because you've seen the scene photos, you know that when your, your deputy uh, medical examiner took her photos, that she pulled the dog takes out of Lynn's blouse to take a picture of them close up. Yes. Right? So when, by pulling those dog takes up and taking a picture close up, that's going to interfere and change the distribution of this powder. That's true. And you weren't at the scene, so you really don't know what, you didn't go there, you don't really know what she exactly looked like, where powder or pills were, you would just rely upon pictures. I'm relying on the photos. And yeah. you were mainly relying upon the photos that, that you're, you took at your office. I actually didn't finish answering your last question. Um, I relied on the photos and the report that my staff wrote, which, you know, I mean, I never just look at the photos. I also listen to what they say because photos can't capture everything. So I want to be complete in answering that question. Fair enough. And your uh, report of your deputy... Uh, never mentioned about any pills or uh, substance in her hair. You, you noted that it didn't say it. It talked about it, it on the chest, but nothing in her hair. I don't recall specifically. But you relied upon it? Yes. You didn't notice that it seemed strange that it doesn't appear in her hair at the scene, that nobody mentioned seeing it at the scene, and then suddenly you see it at your office, that maybe the body was jiggled in some fashion? I guess I, when I, what I saw at autopsy, I could not conclude one way or another if it was representative of what was at the scene. You would, on this picture on the right, you can see a little bit of a pill in her mouth. <coughs> True. Right, and you, you saw that it, it was still like that when she arrived at your office, there was still a little pill. That's true. And we don't know as to powder that's there, whether that just fell out of her mouth. If she was taking, if she had crushed her pills, 
She was crushing pills and taking them. We don't know, you, as you sit there now, what fell out of her mouth. I would say that's really not from her mouth. I looked inside of her mouth. You can see her tongue. You can see her lips. There's no, and <laughs> the powder isn't wet, and it's not stained red, and there's no, no residue in her mouth. So I would say, no, the powder did not come out of her mouth. That was my, that's my opinion. Okay, well, it wouldn't be wet any longer by the time that you all found, uh, looked at her body. It would also not be powder if it was mixed with saliva. Your deputy didn't arrive till 6.10 to the scene. 911 was called at quarter to five. I don't disagree with those. Yes, I don't disagree with that. All right. At, a pre at the previous hearing that the reason you didn't test all the pills that, that were found inside of her in the colon and in her, uh, in, in her stomach um, and have thrown them out since, that, that you didn't test them because they were not dissolved and not part of her blood toxicology. Do you remember testifying to that? Yes. But two of them really do look like they were probably dissolved. Yes. You were wrong when you said that. I could have answered that question better. True. If Lynn was using her fingers from that plate that we saw, the orange plate, with the powder, the crushed pills on it, using her fingers or that spoon that you, you saw the spoon on the floor, right? Yes. Um, that's never been tested either, right? Spoon. No. Uh, but if she's using her fingers or that spoon to put these crushed pills in her mouth, it could also just spill that way. She's leaning back in a recliner, right? Yes. So that doesn't have to be from somebody sprinkling it over her. It could be from Lynn's own attempt to take all these pills, these crushed pills. Imagine if you're using your hands. It's not going to all make it into your mouth. Did you want her to answer? Because she shook her head, but we didn't hear <laughs> You shook your head, yes. Thank you for the record. Right? If you're using your fingers to put pills in your mouth, they're not going to all make it into your mouth. Some is going to fall down. That could happen. Now, when you uh, got your results from the lab, there was um, THC tetrahydrazoline in her stomach. Yes. Like a teaspoon. I have no idea about that quantity. I thought you got a quantity from NMS labs. No. So you don't know how much is in? You, you don't know? No. When you're talking about quantities of eye drops, um, I'm showing you, I'll show the state first, a box of Visine. I'm going to show you, this is a box of Visine, would you agree? Yes. And as I look at the front of it, it says it's a half ounce, 15 ml. Can I show it to you to see sure. if you agree that that's how much is in here? Mm -hmm. yes. Is that yes? Yes, I'm sorry, yes. 15 ml. Yes. So 15 mLs, would that be um, about three teaspoons? I'm not sure of the conversion. It could right. be. I, I'm just not sure of a conversion of a teaspoons from mLs. So you don't know what an ml, one ml is in quantity? Compared to a teaspoon, um, 15 mLs is half an ounce, for example. How many teaspoons is in an ounce? When you sent the samples uh, from Lynn to NMS labs, uh, you just asked for a general or an enhanced panel to be done? Initially, yes. 
and then you asked for other labs to be run over the, over the months. Yes. You sent request after request to NMS labs to add additional, additional testing. Correct. And looking at the at the scene, going back on that plate and the powder, I just want to ask you, do you know whether that plate was on her lap when the EMS arrived and they moved it? I don't know. You didn't talk to the, to the, uh, to the EMS folks? No, I did not. Uh, would it have been important to you to know if that plate was on her stomach? or on her chest area, and then was moved? I would like more information rather than less. First responders or EMS, if, if a plate is on a chest or on a stomach, and they're, they're coming to, to try to save somebody, they're going to move that plate, true? Yes, I would right. say so. All right. Now, the NMS labs, It came back, you said, uh, with the THC or THZ in it, and that was a little surprising to you. Correct. And you hadn't seen that before? No, I haven't. And that was a decision made by NMS Labs to test for the THZ. You didn't ask them to test for that. That's true. And you've since learned that, is it uh, Sherry K Kachinko? Who works at that lab? Who Dr. Kasinko. Is that who you were dealing with at that lab? Yes. Kasinko, K-A-C-I-N-K-O? Yes. First name was Sherry? Yes. And that's somebody you were talking to over the months um, about this case, right? True. And did you learn that she had a special interest in trying to figure out if people have THC in their system? She stated she was collecting the data from the labs, yes. She had a special interest in it. Yes. And that's who brought this to your attention. Brought what to my attention? THZ. The laboratory panel includes that drug as a matter of course. It's not a special request, nor did Dr. Kosinko ask that it be done. But when I called her for more information, and you know their, um, the lab's experience with it, which is not uncommon that I would do that, like for other types of novel drugs, um, she expressed that she was reviewing um, all the TH tetrahydrazoline cases in NMS's experience. So, so that's true. She was a special interest. She was reviewing them. Yes. And NMS keeps a, a communication history report that you've seen, right? I don't know if I've seen that. We requested uh, a copy we being the defense, we request a copy of your complete file, right? Yes. And you provided it. Yes. And um, certain things were included in it, like um, communications and photographs and medical records, right? Yes. And your autopsy protocol. Yes. And all the lab reports. Yes. All right. And speaking of that file that you gave us, Yesterday, you introduced a bunch of exhibits um, that were never provided to us uh, when we requested your file. For example, Exhibit 211 with this um, summary of cases. Yes. I didn't see that in that file. I went back and checked. I created that table for the purpose of this trial. I see. And was that the same for the 210, this uh, summary of Lynn's medical history? That's correct. You prepared this? Yes. Yourself? Yes. Did you have help with the, from the district attorney? No. And, and I will say, I didn't do the typing, but I did put the information in a format for my assistant to type. But no, I got no help from the district attorney. Okay, so you put this together for the purpose of litigation. Correct. All right, this isn't something that was in your file. Correct. That's why I didn't have it. Right. So did you put this together so that you could 
explain to this jury Lynn's medical history? Yes, and also that it would help my own recollection because there were a lot of pages in the medical record and I wanted to make sure as best as possible to be clear and correct. And you took all of her medical history and summarized it best you could in these 13 pages. I wouldn't say summarized it, but I focused on, because I focused on certain elements. Summarizing it would be probably a larger document. And what you decided to do on Exhibit 210 was put in the, at least the things that you thought were really most relevant. Yes. So you did your uh, NMS, your, uh, you got your NMS lab report, and the report came back. Do we have that? We might just need to. One minute, please. We'll look at that. Are you looking at Exhibit 35? Yeah. Would be one of them. Computers here. Five was actually the two reports, but it's marked as one. Yes. So we're going to show you what's been um, admitted as Exhibit 35. Recognize this report? Yes. And the date on this is August 7th of 2019? Yes. This is the last report? Yes. There had been many of them before that. This is the fourth. Right. There had been three priors. Yes. Plus an in-between report with the results of uh, some uh, pills you found on Lynn. Correct. So sort of the fifth report. Okay. Fair? Yes. You see in uh, this report, the second, so I, we see arsenic at the top. I guess I want to address that. Everyone's got a little bit of arsenic in them, right? Yes. Okay. That's not of concern. But baclofen, result 1.1. Yes. And that is, that's high. Yes. Page five, on and do you see baclofen in the blood? A number nine there on the yes. reference comments. Yes. This is on the NMS lab results. They indicate what? It's a skeletal muscle relaxant. Is that right? Yes. And and I want to go to the third paragraph of nine. What is that? Can you read that to the jury? Yes. The third paragraph of number nine. Adverse effects of baclofen overdosage may include vomiting, muscle hypotonia, marked salivation, drowsiness, visual disturbances, coma, respiratory depression, seizures, and death. Toxic blood concentrations are reported to range from 1.1 to 3.5 micrograms per ml. In a fatality attributed to baclofen postmortem blood and urine concentrations of 17 and 7.6 760 micrograms per mil, respectively, were reported. Okay. So, from what you read, toxic concentrations are reported in 1.1 to 3.5. True? Yes. Lynn was 1.1. Yes. She was in that toxic range. Yes. 
Side effects of baclofen include things like um, hallucinations and confusion. Isn't that right? I don't know. Is that because you're not a toxicologist? I just don't know. Does baclofen have a black, what's a black box warning on a medicine? It's a specific warning as to adverse effects. If a, if a, most, most prescriptions that we get at the pharmacy don't have black box warnings on them, right? I don't know the percentage that do and don't. Does baclofen have a black box warning? I don't know. Would you agree that that's when the government demands that uh, a patient be notified that a drug is very da could, can be very dangerous? I don't know. All right. Also, if we go back up to the first page, looking at some of the results here. Uh, You see the baclofen, and it's 1.1. Yes. You know that on March 7th of 2018, the doctors took Lynn off of baclofen. I know it was discontinued. I don't recall the date. And you kept talking about yesterday of things being discontinued, drugs being discontinued. Correct. But when you said that, that doesn't mean that a person stopped taking them. That's true. A doctor can tell you I'm discontinuing this drug, meaning I'm not going to refill it for you anymore, right? Right. But that doesn't mean that they, they seize their bottle. That's bottles. true. That's true. And clearly, Lynn took baclofen. Yes. Even though it had been discontinued in March. Yes. And you saw that in the Aurora records, that she was discontinued from baclofen. I don't remember the provider, but I do know that they stopped the baclofen. March 7th, you had indicated yesterday, that and that's the day of the discontinuation of baclofen, that she had established care with a Dr. Abdullah. I'm sorry, I, I know she established care with Dr. Abdullah. I don't remember what you said before that. March 7th. If that's what the record says. I'm going by your chart. That's, that's correct then. Okay. So March 7, 2018, uh, Lynn established care with Dr. Abdullah, A-B-D-U-L-A-L. -L. Okay. Did I say his name right? Um, I don't know how he pronounces his name. Okay. And that's because, and that's a primary care physician. Yes. At Aurora. Yes. And the reason she established care with Dr. Abdullah is because her prior primary care physician uh, discharged her because her tox screens or urine screen came up with too many drugs in her system. She was discharged because the urine drug screen was not consistent with the prescriptions. So I'm right. I phrased it, I think, more correctly. Well, doctors, uh, you're, you're a physician, right? Yes. Yesterday you were talking about what physicians think and what they do. Yes. All right. And uh, physicians, if, they, if, if a person's on uh, drugs, oftentimes they will conduct urine screens to make sure that the levels in a person's urine is what they're <coughs> supposed to be. Well, it wouldn't be the level because a urine screen is simply a plus minus. So they're screening to see if they're compliant with what they're prescribed and if there's things that they're not prescribed in the screen. Fair enough. They're looking to see if there's positive results that shouldn't be there. Correct. And when there are, they, uh, they may discharge a patient. They could. Because they're not being compliant with what the doctor has told them to do. That's true. They're taking things that they're not supposed to be taking. Yes. That's what was the case with Lynn. That's what the doctor said, yes. Well, you don't have any reason to dispute what the doctor said. I only question um, the investigation of the urine drug screen because it's a, it's a screen. Okay. Well, 
The doctor discharged her. Correct. I also see on this uh, NMS lab report, if we could put it back up again. That we have um, positive for alprazolam also. Is that right? Yes. Result is 67? Yes. Alprazolam is a drug that's used to treat anxiety. That's true. And it can cause depression. I'm not aware if it does or doesn't. You know that it can call, cause uh, paranoia. I don't know. It can cause suicidal ideations. I don't know. Do you know that it impairs memory and judgment? It can. If you use it with alcohol, you know that it increases a risk of overdose. That's true. And there was alcohol in Lynn's stomach. Yes. Do you think alprazolam is more dangerous to a person than baclofen? In general, the class of drugs that uh, alprazolam belongs to, which are benzodiazepines, are not considered as um, dangerous in isolation, but can be um, can cause problems when combined with other drugs. So I think that depending on dosage and blood levels, alprazolam is less likely to cause problems than some other drugs. I th did you ask me about baclofen? I don't remember. I asked you about alprazolam. Alprazolam, but you didn't compare it to anything. I just can't, no, I can't remember. Okay. Anything. I'm going to bring up Exhibit 35, page 4. It's the same exhibit. And there it is. Can you bring that down a little bit so we can read it? There we go. Is that number 5 on, on uh, the NMS? page here? Uh, po uh, point number five? Yes. Point number five. Yes. And we are we looking at uh, a page page four of the NMS lab? Yes. Report? Yes. This is what they sent you, right? Correct. They wanted you to know about these drugs? Yes. Because uh, they're a toxicologist, a toxicology lab? You don't know. They're a toxicology lab. Why they include this amount of information is uh, their standard procedure. The reasoning I won't, won't speak for. What does under point five, what does the last paragraph say? Reported blood concentrations of alprazolam and alprazolam related fatalities ranged from 100 to 400 nanograms per ml. Um, with a mean of 200 nanograms per ml. In combination with other central nervous system depressants, such as ethyl alcohol, alprazolam can be toxic at low concentrations. Lynn had alcohol in her stomach. Yes. She had alprazolam in her system. <clears throat> yes. In her blood. Yes. Which means it's already um, gone through the stomach. Yes. Into the intestines. I don't know. I mean, it's it's been dig it's entered her bloodstream. Yes. Entered her bloodstream. Yes. Do you know what the cardiovascular effects are of uh, baclofen? I believe it can cause low blood pressure. What about nifedipine? It's given for low blood pressure. What about cyclobenzapine? It has, uh, are you asking about the cardiovascular system? Yeah, I am. I can't recall.
looking at page one of the exhibit again. These are all the drugs that were found in, in Ms. Hernan. In her, in her blood, can you go down on that? And in her gastric fluid, right? Correct. And then liver tissue. Correct. So in her blood was uh, baclof the arsenic, which is natural, but baclofen, ropinarol? Yes. Triamterine, uh, aspirin, acetaminophen? It's not uh, aspirin. It's like a Tylenol? Yes. Uh, Alprazolam. What is hydrocodone? A metabolite of, well, what is hydrocodone? Hydrocodone is a synthetic opioid. It's an opioid. Yes. And we, uh, and tetrahydrosoline, nephetapine, cyclobenzapine, she had a lot of things in her system, didn't she? True. And these were all in her blood, which means they've already been ingested and made it into the bloodstream. True. And all drugs that she was on have various side effects, don't they? True. You might not know what they all are, but, but they have them. Yes. And she had, had uh, this van comison in her system. Is that, is that it for an infection? I'm sorry, what are you referring to? thought I saw van, a hydrochloride. I'm not finding it. Okay, so next page maybe. I may be mistaken about that particular one. Was there, did she have a, any, pre, any medications in her for uh, infection? Not that was uh, revealed by toxicology. It has to reach certain levels to be revealed by toxicology. Or the test has to include looking for it. And they, were you looking for it? It was not included in any of the screens. You didn't ask, even though she was taking it, you didn't ask for it to be tested. I didn't ask, and I don't know if they can. I mean, they can't test for everything, but I didn't ask. They, but you had them test for a lot of things, right? True. How much did it cost to have all these lab tests run? How much did you pay NMS labs? I didn't add it up, but I'm sure it was a lot of money. $20,000? Oh, no, not that much. Okay. Um, for example, the expanded screen on blood is 400 some dollars. So that's the range of, I mean, that just gives an example because I'm familiar with that particular test cost. Every individual test cost, I couldn't tell you. Okay, so you have to pay for each one of these tests. Correct. Um, and you don't know what you paid the lab. No. Do you know? You do you know how many pills? If we look at page one on this report, do you know how many pills Lynn would have to take to reach these various levels? No. And it's hard to know that because you you don't you have to know what the half life is of a pill, right? Well, that would be one piece of information. Yes. There's many pieces of information you have to know. That's true. You have to know when they were taken. Correct. And if they were all taken at once or, or at different times. Correct. You'd have to know what the half-lives were. Yes. And if you don't have that kind of information, it's hard to, it's hard to say. I would say so. At least for you, you can't do that, right? I, no, I don't. I can't and I don't. So as we sit here now, you don't know if she ingested all 30... Uh, of her baclofen or all 30 of her cyclobenzapines, you don't know. I would, I would say that the evidence that she reported side effects from both of those drugs earlier that caused their discontinuation um, suggests that the 30 she was given at the time, it would be less than that, unless she lied about I, uh, her side effects because it looks like she took the pills initially then had side effects. How many were left? I don't know. Well, they're in her system. It's in her system. Yes, it is. Okay, so whether she was discontinued or not, she didn't listen to the doctors. She she took them. Yes. All right. And 
you got medical records for her from ProHealth, right? Yes. Which, uh, and from Aurora. Yes. And from Advanced Pain Management. Yes. That's all I saw. Yes. But there was indication in the records of her seeing people at Freighter. Did you request Freighter records? No. So we don't know what who she might have been seeing there or what she was prescribed there. True. You showed us yesterday the results of sending these sprinkles to the lab. Remember that? Yes. Why did you wait until May 15th of 2019 to send that over to the lab? Why so long? I don't know. I mean, I can't give you an answer about why I didn't do it earlier. I can't recall my um, train of thought in that matter. Had you gotten um, a few days before that an email from <coughs> Detective Hoppy in this case um, giving you some background information about his investigation? I did receive an email. I don't remember the time. And do you remember that there was... Uh, a situation going on with Jesse that might have required more uh, immediate attention? I understand that she was involved in some other issue with the, de with the uh, Sheriff's Department. Okay. Uh, is that why you rushed it off to the lab suddenly on, on, on that day? No, I don't think it had anything to do with that. You were in communication, though, with the, with the with Detective Hoppy, right? Aaron Hoppy? True. Uh, and you said yesterday how you're not part of law enforcement. True. But you work very closely with them. Sometimes. Because if they're, they would be called out to investigate a, a potential crime, um, and if, if it involved a death, it's probably going to involve your office, right? That's true. Okay, so you, you work hand in hand with them. We keep each other informed. Including emails, right? Yes. You email back and forth, uh, and he gave you uh, on, uh, updates on the case? Uh, that time he did. That's the only email I believe that he ever emailed me. Okay. Attorney Kukler, uh, at your convenience, at a good stopping point, I would like to take. Um, this is good. All right, then uh, we'll take our mid morning break. Um, all rise for the jurors, please. Very good. Bring your notebooks with you then, please, and watch your step as you step out of the jury box.
can rejoin. All right, uh, we are back on the record. Attorney Kukler, do you want to are you, do you intend to offer those uh, 584 and 586? Um, the 584 might as well. 584, yes. Let me look for that. That's <laughs> on the record. Or? Yeah, I was just curious, and then if you wanted to, just at some point, and then what about 586, the other one? Um, yeah. You don't have to tell me I'm right now. Sure. I just didn't want to forget. Sure. So, um, but they're both marked, and just make sure they're left here, whether they're received or not. We'll have to keep them for the record. And I would ask that the boxes remain with them. Okay. Yes, I think we should have the boxes. Okay. That's the way they were opened up in front of the jury. You can, oh. Attorney Galavis will make that happen. Perfect. Okay. Then anything we need to address prior to bringing the jury out from the state? No, thank you. From the defense? No, thank you. All right. Thank you, Madam <coughs> Clerk, if you'll bring them in. We have a row of water up there <laughs> for the witnesses. All rise for the jury. Actually, they don't want them touching that, so. Thank you, everyone. Please be seated. Attorney Kukler, you may continue. Thank you. So, um, Doctor, going back to Exhibit 35, which is the NMS lab report, we're going to pull it up on the screen so we can all look at it together again. Can you see it? Yes. Just waiting for it to talk. Probably delay for the jury to see it. They can see it now. All right, we've talked about some of these uh, compounds that were found in, in Lynn's system, right? Yes. Now I would like to talk about the uh, nephetapine. That shows on here a level of 22 NG. Yes. Per milliliter, is that what that stands for? Yes. And if we look at page seven, do you, this is um, also in the NMS lab report, and they, and they're again giving you information about the nephetapine, right? Yes. And nephetapine is, you'd agree, is, is a dangerous drug. 
It's a regularly prescribed drug. I don't know that dangerous would be what I would say. Well, opioids, uh, opioids are a regularly prescribed drug, but they can be dangerous, right? All drugs, all drugs can be dangerous. Okay, well, some are more dangerous than others, right? Yes. All right. Do you consider nifedipine to be a dangerous drug? No. Do you consider baclofen to be a dangerous drug? Maybe more than nifedipine. All right. You'd agree that both, back, you'd agree that baclofen has fatalities. Overdosing on baclofen, there's cases reported of fatalities with baclofen. True. You'd agree that there are reported fatalities with nifedipine. I don't know. Um, let's see, two fatalities are reported right here. I was not aware. I mean, I haven't read those papers. But this is the report for Lynn's case. So I agree that two fatalities are reported at least at the point that NMS Labs prepared this report. That's true. Could be different now. True. And um, you didn't know that till today. Well, I probably read this before. I'm saying that I did not um, independently um, have knowledge other than what's in this report of nifedipine fatalities. Well, I didn't ask you if you had knowledge outside of the report, if you read any articles. I'm sorry. I asked you, I asked you, if it wasn't true that there's fatalities from nifedipine, and you didn't know the answer till you just looked at what I put on the board for you. That's true. And that's because you didn't study it uh, until today. True. And the other drug I mentioned to you is um, page one, will be cyclobenzapine. Lynn had, you can see, a level of 54 NG per milliliters. Yes. And if we look at page five of the NAS lab report, we can learn a little bit about cyclobenzapine, right? Yes. And cyclobenzapine has two, uh, also uh, two fatal overdose cases that at least the NMS labs was aware of and reported <coughs> the materials that they sent to you. That's true. And you didn't read that until today. I didn't remember that. I'm sure I read it before today, but I didn't remember. You didn't mention anything about that in your autopsy protocol. I didn't mention cyclobenzaprine overdose in my autopsy protocol? Right, in your autopsy protocol, in your history and information that you provide, you didn't talk about people dying from overdoses of these other drugs that I've just brought to your attention today. My autopsy protocol doesn't discuss anything but uh, blood levels. Well, you concluded that um, Ms. Hernan died from tetrahydrazoline overdose, right? I did, and I included the other medications as contributing conditions. But you, your conclusion was that she died from the tetrahydrazoline, right? That, yes. And you don't know, as you sit there today, that whether she voluntarily ingested that. You don't know. It was my opinion she didn't, but knowledge of her action, no. Well, you weren't there. I wasn't there. You don't know if she if she put it in, uh, if she drank it out of the uh, the bottle, which I don't know where my bottle is anymore. But you don't know if she drank it. Or, here we got them right out of the bottle, or whether she put uh, some in uh, water, or whether she put it in alcohol. That's true. But you do know that she was stockpiling medications at her home. She did not discard her medications. She had a lot of medications there, and they were found in her system. Yes. Some medications that she shouldn't have any in her system. True. Because she just kept, she saved them all, it looked like. She saved them. And took them. 
and took them. She took prescriptions that she had since been found to be allergic to. Yes. Ones that doctors had told her to stop taking. True. And cyclobenzapine is a CNS, it, it affects the CNS system, doesn't it? It does. You were talking about that CNS yesterday, weren't you? Yes. That was something you thought was important. Yes. And cyclobenzapine uh, also uh, adversely affects the uh, central nervous system. It does. There would be no medical reason for Lynn to have taken all of these drugs on October 3rd of 2018 that you know of. All of these drugs? That's right, all of these drugs. She the had indication of the them. The combination? Yeah, I mean, she had indications for some and others she didn't. Well, the, 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 we see toxic levels of some of these drugs in her system. Oh, baclofen. And you say THC, too. And that's Tetrahydrazoline? Well, absolutely. Okay. So um, she ingested a lot of drugs. Yes. She was holding on to over the months. Six months. Yes. Six months ago, they had been discontinued. True. If I show you, I'd like to show you Exhibit 21. You had in your materials a medication inventory. Do you know what I'm talking about? Yes. Let's see if we can bring that up. It's before her. I'll publish it. Uh, this uh, will move Exhibit 21 into the record. I believe it's already part of the record. Okay, thank you, Judge. Now, what, these are the list of prescriptions that were, here we go, here's page one. We're looking at the, the bottles of, at bottles whether they had, uh, whether they were empty or they had a couple pills in them, but whatever was recovered from Lynn's home is listed on your confidential medical inventory. That's right. It's two pages. I think it's three. Oh, three pages. And if I look at, as I look down on this chart, can you see? You have put down the quantity that were prescribed and the date that it was filled. Yes. For example, Alprazolam was filled September 20th of 2018. Yes. So it was that must have been filled while she was in the hospital. That's puzzling. It must have been filled while she was in the hospital. There's a pharmacy at the hospital, right? She wouldn't have been able to get this prescription from the hospital. Okay. Well, it was filled then, right? Apparently, from Walgreens. And, of course, we have automatic refills at the pharmacy, right? Do you know about that? Because I do. They, they refill my prescriptions automatically. I get notices that the, the pills have been refilled. There is, yes. Okay. So this one was filled on 9-20 of 18, refilled. Yes. And when you, uh, and they were, 30 pills were prescribed. Yes. And when your office recovered the bottle, the scene, how many were in that? None. So they were all taken. They're not in the bottle. All right. And there's another bottle, Alprazolam, that was from August 20th, right? Yes. So it looks like she gets that maybe once a month. Yes. And that bottle had <coughs> zero. Yes. And baclofen had been prescribed and discontinued, right? Yes. But the bottle was there, there was nothing in it. Correct. And nothing in the Alprazolam. Correct. Both of them, two bottles. Yes. So again, this is, seems to be a person who held on to her prescriptions. Yes. 
held on to the bottles, even when they were discontinued or when she was told to discontinue them or when she picked up a new prescription. True. And so other than, there's a couple, the hydrochloride, what is that? I don't see hydrochloride. Oh, Vancomycin uh, hydrochloride? Yes. That's the antibiotic um, for C. difficile infections. Oh, that's the antibiotic. And that was filled on 928. Yes. That's the day she was released from the hospital. Yes. And there was 21 left? Yes. Out of, how many was she prescribed? A 56. 56. Is that almost, how many do you take a day? It says eight, eight capsules a day. Eight a day. Yes. So by this point, she should have taken, what, 24? Three days? Um, well, it really depends. 29, 30, 1, 2. That's four days times eight. That would be 32. Okay, so she may have taken those as pretty close to as prescribed. Yes. For antibiotic. Yes. And we go down. Uh, Nephetapine, uh, that was prescribed on 92818. That's the dangerous drug we were just talking about, right? We just talked about nifedipine, yes. And there's two pills left. Yes. And there should be 25? Around, 20, yes. 26? Yes, around that. Next page. And less, uh, these are less significant drugs. Some of these are uh, Nexium and vitamin D and so on and so forth. So that's all I need from that exhibit. Um, but going back to page one, actually, I, I do want to go back to page one. I'm sorry, Madam Clerk. Uh, how many prescriptions? We have a, couple, a few prescriptions at the bottom that are from, a uh, few prescriptions throughout that are from 9-28-18, right? Yes. And let's see, the first one I see is from Dr. Lu, and the next one is Dr. Lu, L-U-U, -U, and Dr. Lu and Dr. Lu. Yes. So you say you found that uh, interesting, but that's the day she's released from the hospital, 928, right? Yes. And that's her doctor at the hospital. That was the discharge doctor, yes. Right, so he obviously called in prescriptions for her. Yes. So, so it's not odd. No. That's good on that exhibit, thank you. I'm gonna show you what we've marked as exhibit 563. It's something that we received from your office. Can you take a look at this? Uh, just uh, you, you doctor, it's a two page document and see if you recognize 563. show her the second page. Okay. And can you go up to page one and show her the exhibit sticker? Do you see 563 on there? Yes. Okay. Is this a document, uh, is this a 2020 annual report prepared by your office, Waukesha County Medical Examiner, on suicide data? Yes. Okay, uh, move for admission, Judge of 563. Objection. All right, Exhibit 563 is received. Uh, ask permission to publish, please. Granted. <clears throat> Waiting for the jury to see it.
So this is a document your office prepared for a 2020 annual report, is that right? Yes. And so, of course, um, it ends, uh, this particular uh, report ends, goes for the years 2013 through 2020. Yes. A seven-year period. Yes. Do you prepare one of these every, every year? We try to. Not always, though. Staffing issues. Is this document, uh, 563, was it, it's, it's accurate information, right? I would say yes. And in, on page two of this document, you, you say dust by manner suicide. Is yes. that right? Suicide is classified as the deliberate act of taking one's own life. Yes. In 2020, the Waukesha County Medical Examiner's Office certified 51 deaths as suicide. Yes. Which accounted for 13% of the total deaths handled by your office for that year. Yes. Firearms were 53%. Yes. And 61% of all suicides were completed by individuals ages 40 to 69 years old. Yes. Lynn Hernan fell in that age range, true? Yes. Now looking at page one, you, I, I can see you put a chart together and at the top, across the top, I see the year 2013, 2014 and so on. Yes. Is that right? And then uh, going down on the left column, you have what's called category. Yes. And that is where you list the different ways that people committed suicide. Yes. And then the column below that has the same years, and then you broke it down by male and female. Is that right? Yes. And then you broke it down by age. Yes. And uh, so age 19 and under, ages 20 to 40, 41, 64, and 65 and above. Yes. That's how you chose to... Dis, uh, display the statistics. Yes. And if you look at the different categories on there, there's many, appears to be many ways that people unfortunately decide to end their life, own life. Yes. We've got asphyxia. What does that mean? Well, it could be um, hanging, or it could be someone putting a plastic bag over their head, that type of thing. But you have hanging as a separate oh, well category. Then, I'm sorry. Um, sometimes it's under asphyxia. So asphyxia would probably be the use of uh, an inert gas or um, putting a bag over your head. Okay. And then what is carbon monoxide, then? That's something different than the inert gas that you were just mentioning? Um, yeah, carbon monoxide is a poison from auto exhaust, typically. And blunt force injury, when you say that? What is it? You had a, a death yes. from that? Yeah, it, there's only one. I don't know the specifics of that. All right. Drowning, falling, jumping, gunshots, hanging, all sorts of different ways, right? Yes. And one of the categories is ingestion, inhalation. Yes. Ingestion would include people who took overdose of medications. True. That would be that category. Yes. And so in every year you have people who die from, by suicide, from ingestion. Yes. Of course, there's people who accidentally die from ingesting things, right? True. Like uh, somebody could decide to use a controlled substance, I don't know, heroin or some other substance and could die from it, but they might be doing, they might be taking the drug to, get some kind of high from it, Correct. and they might accidentally die. True. They didn't have the intent to kill themselves. Correct. But these would be people who had the intent to kill themselves. Yes. And in, you have, um, in 2029, folks that did that. Is in that right? 2029? 2020. 2020. I see the number nine. I see, yes. Is that what that means, nine people? Yes. And then we can look across and see that in the year before, five people, the year before, eight people, the year before, 15 people, five people, nine people, six people, eight people. Yes. So it sounds like every year there's, there's people who do that. Correct. They decide to kill themselves by taking, ingesting pills. 
Yes. And if I look down at the lower category on that same page, it's interesting, isn't it, that, for example, in 2020, when you're looking at the age range for people, that you see 24 people in the 41 to 64 range that decide to commit suicide. Yes. And 13, 65 and above. Yes. So this is not, uh, this is, uh, in fact, uh, more, more people uh, kill themselves in the higher age range than in the younger age range, 40 and under. Yes. Okay. And certainly Lynn fell in that, the higher age range. What, how old was she when she died? 62. 62? Yes. Okay. And when we're talking about ingestion here, we would be uh, including taking any substance that were poisonous. Yes. Not just pills. Correct. So if somebody decided to take tetrahydrazoline to kill themselves, if you could do such a thing, um, and you concluded it was a suicide, that would fall under that too. True. <laughs> and when we're looking at people who die from suicide, um, from, uh, this doesn't include people who die just from chronic illnesses and things like that. These are people who intended to take their own life. Yes. Okay, you can take that down. You yesterday prepared a summary of Lynn's medical history and you put it together in a chart. 13 pages. Yes. Depending on if it's enlarged or not, but 13 pages, right? Yeah. And you put it on a cork board so we could see that too. Yes. And this is the, the records uh, that you thought were significant enough to mention in court. Yes. You're the one that obtains Lynn's medical records. Her office. office. Yes. And you said that you're not exactly sure why they sent the, the, the certain years that they did. I can, I don't know if that was my testimony, but my staff ask for medical records on a request form and they usually have parameters. So for each group of medical records, I would have to see what the staff member put on the parameters. So you'd agree that you didn't just ask for all of her records? There probably were parameters. Well, there were parameters because I've looked at it. Okay. And you, you put parameters on it like the last eight visits or the last two years. Yes. You put those kind of parameters on a record, so that's what you got. Right. And you said your staff made that decision on what to ask for, not you? I make the decision on typical records on any um, on general cases, and on specific cases I may ask for additional records. So the parameters are generally what's asked for, or, for example, in this case, if Tabby, Tabitha said, um, what do you want me to put on the records at the time that she was requesting them? I might have said, let's go for this. Was well, that what you did? I don't recall in this case. Okay, well, I want to talk about the specific, specifics of this case, not what you might do in some okay. case. Well, you so don't I, don't rem I don't remember in this right. case. Well, I, I, I got those records from you, and, for example, on the pro-health records, when I printed out what you got from the hospital, this is... This is, this is the records. Do you see this big binder? 1,321 pages. That's just pro help. I'm gonna object, that was not a question. She actually did ask a question, it was not answered. She said, do you see this binder? I see this binder. So it's you, overruled. You, it's 1,321 pages, do you recall? That's how many? pages you received? No, it isn't. It isn't that number of pages. It isn't? It was more? It was less. Okay. So then you think that um, 
some of the records you haven't seen. Well, yes, for sure. And as to the Aurora records um, and the, the pain management records, if I have a binder like this from your, uh, of them, uh, would, would that be that you didn't get all the records, or does this look like what you received also? Oh, that looks like more records than I have. Okay. Well, let's look at your chart from yesterday and look at uh, Exhibit 5, what we've marked as 541, which are pro-health records. Because you've referenced a lot of them in your chart. Yes. Looking, I would like to show you uh, first um, to take a look at the page. Do you have, see a page in front of you? Yes. Do you see it's a certification of the medical records? Yes. For Lynn Hernan? Yes. And uh, it's 1,325 pages. Does that sound right? I don't know. I mean, I see that's what it says. Okay. And that's this is for the period... July 20th, 18 through September 28th of 18. Is that right? Yes. And uh, that would include uh, the date she was released from the hospital, 9 28 18. Yes. If you look at, if we show you, um, well, Your Honor, uh, I would move for admission of the medical records. I would object to foundation. Denied at this time or overruled, but we'll reserve that uh, till later. I will show you page one of the actual record. Maybe it's page three. Do you see, see that record in front of you? Yes. Page three? Yes. This is from... Uh, uh, July 20th, 2018. Yes. And that shows that Lynn arrived urgently at the hospital by ambulance. Yes. So she has, uh, at least you can see here, gone to the hospital on an urgent basis by, by ambulance. Yes. I'm going to object. That's not the page three that I have. I didn't it's page six on the exhibit. Page six. I'd ask that we be very precise about what we're showing the witness, please. Page six. You'd agree that, that that happened? Yes. And if you, uh, we'll show you page seven. Can you see that on your screen? Yes. Lynn presented at the emergency room for multiple symptoms, is that right? Yes. <coughs> Abdominal pain with nausea and vomiting and tremors? Yes. She's having trouble taking her normal medications? Yes. The doctor thought there might be a component of benzodiazepine withdrawal going on? Yes. What's her differential? Uh, well, differential diagnosis that they considered was that withdrawal, also po possible alcohol withdrawal. I don't see that. You see the differential? No. Can you highlight it there? Oh, I see. Okay. Do you see it now? Yes, I see. A differential is when a doctor's considering the possible things that could be wrong with a patient. Is that right? True. And so one of them was the possible benzodiazepine withdrawal, alcohol withdrawal, withdrawal. Is that right? Yes. 
if we look at the next page, eight. Do you see in the middle of the top paragraph that she vomit up, vomited up multiple pills? Yes. Tried to take extra? Yes. So she's going to run out two days before her next refill, which is next week? Yes. She's worried that she'll go through withdrawal again? Yes. And this doctor felt, this emergency room doctor apparently felt it was reasonable to give her some more Xanax? Yes. Because he could see that she had been vomiting there? Yes. And in her medical history, down below, do you see that, um, what, what, what is listed as her diagnosis for her medical history? Agoraphobia, anxiety, chronic obstructive pulmonary disease, gastroesophageal reflux disease, osteoarthritis, thyroid cancer, thyroid disease, vomiting. Well, underneath thyroid disease, it also says cancer in bold, or uh, capital letters, doesn't it? True. And then vomiting. Yes. And we were talking, you were talking to the district attorney yesterday about uh, uh, um, her mental health status. You'd agree with me, wouldn't you, that agoraphobia is a, a mental health disorder? Yes. It's in the DSM? Yes. The DSM is a is a book that goes through a possible mental health, it goes through mental health diagnoses, right? Yes. And agoraphobia is in here, right? In the DSM? I, I haven't looked, but I would not be surprised. And what and agoraphobia is a person who's afraid to go out places. Is that right? Yes. Afraid to go in elevators. I don't know the scope. It's a, considered a social anxiety disorder. And anxiety is a disorder too. Yes. It's also in the DSM, isn't it? I imagine it is. You're not completely familiar with the DSM. I don't use the DSM in my work. But when you're talking here today about uh, or yesterday in your te testimony about her mental health, one way we can, when we look at the things in her record, we can look them up, we can look things up in the DSM and see if it's actually a mental health problem, right? Yes. And anxiety disorders is in here. Yes, I'm, so, I'm sure it is. Substance abuse is in here. I would agree that would be likely. So she's got a lot of mental health issues going on in her life, over her life. Anxiety, agoraphobia, substance abuse, alcohol is in here under a substance, and pills, right? Yes. Well, I'm, again, I haven't looked in the book, but I wouldn't be surprised. Because you, you, you're a physician, you know that. Well, I know they're mental health disorders. I'm just saying I haven't looked it in the book. When she arrived at the hospital, you'd agree that, even though you didn't put it in her chart, uh, they noted that she arrived uh, with body odor and disheveled. Would you agree with that? I don't remember. Can we show this page? We'll give you the exact 
page. Are you talking about the hospital visit in September? We're still in the hospital records, pro -hop. But which hospital visit, so it's clear? This is from September 15, 2018. This, this is the beginning of her long stay, right, Doctor? Yes. Page 76. Do you see? Yes, I do see. Her body, she had body odor and she was disheveled. Correct. Permission to publish this page. Go ahead. showing you what's 76 of the exhibit, which is different than the actual record. Is that on the doing screen now? Okay, so you can see that, um, can you highlight that? Attorney mm -hmm. Nebreski, the body odor and she's just shoveled, is that right? That's right. And then move to 78 on, or seven, the next page on this document, which would be 77. And you can see this was a advanced care planning with Mary Neubauer, is that right? In the middle of the page? I don't think that's what I'm oh, looking at. One more page, 78. They're double-sided. Yes. Patient was not overly welcoming of conversation. Yes. And you, you had a note about 921 and your note, is that right? Yes. But you, you cited uh, the notes from a person, A. Period Thompson, is that right? Right. But there was another person apparently dealing with her that day who seems to be Mary Neubauer. Yes. N-E-W for Neubauer. And that person um, in the, made a note that Lynn was not overly welcoming a conversation. Yes. And then a little bit further down, there's a note from September 19th. Uh, do you see that social work received consult about patient needing HCPOA document? Yes. Patient provided the social worker with a living will document and an attached notarized sheet adding Jesse under her living will. Next page. Social work discussed the difference between a living will and an HCPOA document. Yes. She was too tired to fill out the other document, right? Yes. So you can see that on September 19th, she wanted to make sure the hospital knew that Jessie was her, on her living will. Yes. Is that a document to make health care decisions with the living will? I don't think I can speak to the difference between a living will and an HCPOA. I'm familiar that an HCPOA is a health care power of attorney that does um, reflect um, decision-making power for health care. Okay. And also while she's in the hospital, on the record, page 139, but is actually page 144. We're going to show you that. Do you see the hospitalist progress report, uh, or note, I should say, from September 21 of 2018? Yes. And he says, uh, this is Kevin Chan, Dr. Chan. Is that right? Yes. That's the person we talked about before that had sent all those prescriptions to the pharmacy on 928. No. That's a different person? That's Dr. Lu. Oh, yeah, Dr. Lu. Okay, this is Dr. Chan, and he said uh, medical decision making one risk. Do you see that? Yes. 
High is high in her case, he says. Is that right? Yes. Acute illness posed threat to life or bodily function, chronic illness with severe exacerbation, change in neurological status, cardiovascular studies and o, and or endoscopy with risk factors, major surgery, uh, parenteral controlled substance drug require, requiring monitoring. Is that right? Yes. You didn't put that in your chart? No. <coughs> the record from the hospital state, a consult by Dr. Taft on 9-22-18, infectious disease consult. Do you remember reading about that? Yes. And just for the record, you're on page 509. I'm on 509 and 510. 509, she smokes uh, about a pack a day for 35 years, is that right? Yes. A family friend indicated she has a history of alcohol abuse, but the patient states she has no recent alcohol consumption, is that right? Yes. And. You don't know all the friends that visited Lynn at the hospital, true? True. If the police interviewed a neighbor who said she she uh, visited Lynn at the hospital, you don't know anything about that? I do remember reading that in the police report. Okay, so you know that a neighbor visited her? Yes. You know Jesse visited her? Yes. Okay. Do you know anybody else who visited her? No. I thought yesterday you weren't sure who visited her. Well, it depends how the question was asked. All right. She indicated that she's had six to seven weeks of diarrhea prior to coming into the emergency department. Is that right? Yes. And nausea and vomiting. Yes. If we look at the next page, ROS, is that review of symptoms? Review of systems. Oh, systems. And she's talking about her stools are um, watery. Is that right? Yes. But look at the last two lines of that our review of the, of the systems. Do you see the doctor indicates, but her story is a little tangential, and she often contradicts herself. So it's unclear regarding the timing of events. She insists it was just one ABX that she had taken before the diarrhea st started. Yes. So she wasn't, um, at least this particular provider seemed to not feel that her story was the best. She contradicted herself. Yes. And you mentioned yesterday that you, uh, and you talked about, and we brought it up this morning already, about the, the consult on... 921 of 18. <coughs> yes. I'm going to object to the exhibit being moved and published at the same time without testimony about what page we're on or that the witness knows what it is. 516. I've been allowing it because it's very clear the records that this doctor testified about reviewing previously, even though it may not be the same exact exhibit. So I've made that determination, but I agree. Just for the record, we should have the page numbers reflected. We're on page 516. Now, this is the note, is it not, for... Uh, Ann Thompson, or A period, on your record you have A Thompson, here it says Ann Thompson. Yes. And isn't it true that when she met with Lynn, she said she met with the patient along with Mary Neubauer, LCSW. That's, uh, would that be a licensed uh, clinical social worker? Mm. Towards the bottom. Towards the bottom, okay. I see, yes. 
And Ms. Thompson said, I introduced the role of palliative medicine and how we help patients and families deal, dealing with serious, potentially life-limiting illnesses, right? Yes. Am I reading that correctly? Yes. And help them to navigate their care and focusing on the whole person, providing emotional, social, and spiritual support. Correct? Yes. So far? Yes. Including symptom management, information sharing about what to expect from the illness and treatment and so on. Is that right? Yes. And she right away seemed upset. <coughs> Is that true? Yes. And she indicated that she is frustrated. She's had these issues for five years and nothing has helped. Yes. And also while in the hospital, she met with provider Stephen Jacobson. Yes. And she met with him on uh, September 15th of 2018. Is that when he prepared his report? Can we bring this page up? Page 70. Page 70 of our record. Yes. And you, you didn't list him for a specific date, but you did put him uh, on page 10 of your record. Dr. S. Jacobson, ER, is that right? Yes. And you said uh, what you put down for under him was six to seven weeks diarrhea, earlier nausea, vomiting per Jesse, three to four weeks, review of symptoms, or review of, uh, would you say S is uh, not symptoms, but review of systems? Right, yes. Negative, except as above. Yes. No, oh, I'm uh, showing you in front of you the, his page, and do you see that she indicates um, that she has multiple episodes a day of the diarrhea? Third line. Third line. Yes. Chief complaints, diarrhea weakness, right? Yes. Six to seven weeks of diarrhea. Yes. Multiple episodes a day. Yes. She's starting to feel more weak. Yes. She says she's dehydrated. Yes. She says her eyes feel dry. Yes. Well, there's another mention of eyes. Yes. Not in, you didn't write that on your chart. No. Because really, as we go through this, you're going to, you would agree, wouldn't you, that she regularly talks about her eyes bothering her. I don't know if it's regular, but she does complain about it. So you don't think it's regular? I would have to look at each individual um, health care provider admission to see if that was a complaint. I didn't uh, see anything in your record that uh, she's been managing with difficult, increasing difficulty and that she uh, he also met with Jesse, who's the power of attorney, who's a close friend. I'm going to object to publishing this portion of this page and ask for a sidebar. All right, I'll take up the issue at sidebar. If Madam Clerk can take it down for a moment.
Hold on one second. No. So the objection is sustained, and uh, you may question this portion of the exhibit will not be published further. <laughs> right. Okay. A couple of things. First of all, um, you have you have the uh, page uh, in front of you from uh, Dr. Jacobson. Yes. Okay. And without saying how the information came to be, is there information in this record that uh, that the person uh, that that Lynn Has a has uh, has a history of um, using alcohol. Yes. And when I started uh, questioning you, Doctor, about these records, uh, these are certified records that came to uh, the defense through the district attorney's office, you got a separate set of records? Yes. Did the district attorney give you a copy of the, this full set of records? To no. Look at? No. Okay. So some of the records that you received are included, all of the records you received are included in here, but you have a, a smaller portion, is that right? That's true. And do you have any explanation for why the uh, Pro Health would have given you a, a smaller portion of records? Um, or don't you know? Well, we may have asked for a smaller portion of records, or they may not have been available at the time we made the request. These records you provided, or your summary you provided, you also, when you could find it, made a note of what Lynn's weight was. Is that right? Yes. And you showed it fluctuated. Yes. She would, it would be lower, it would go up, then it would go down again and go up. Right? It, flu it fluctuated. It fluctuated. Would you agree that it, it ought, uh, when she was discharged from the hospital, according to your chart, uh, not, or let me see, the last weight you noted was on 921.18, and you noted 221 pounds. Is that right? Yes. And would you agree at autopsy she was 251 pounds? Without reviewing my record, I would say whatever's in the report is true. Do you have a copy of your autopsy with you? I do. Could you just take a look at that? Sure. Yes, 251 pounds. And on 921, she was 221 pounds. Yes. So it looks like in that would be about 10 days later, 921 to October 3rd. A little more, yes. 11 days? Are there 28 days in September? No, 30. Oh, 30 days in September, yeah. So that would be uh, nine days left? Nine plus um, three. 12. 12 days. So in 12 days, she put on 30 pounds. Yes.
When Lynn was, uh, before Lynn died, you'd agree that she was using a walker and a cane? I remember the walker. Six sixty of the record will show you. Do you see her living environment? Oh. What is it says D M E U S P T A. What does that mean? Okay. Um. Now where is that? I was just reading the last thing you you pointed me to. You, um, we'll highlight okay. this for you. Okay. Um, oh. Can I erase? I drew on my own screen. Thank you. I don't know about DME. PTA is prior to admission. Do you see where I put that red mark? Yes. Okay. Can you see? Yes. A uh, type of home equipment. Shower chair oxygen. Yes. DME use PTA walker cane tub shower chair. Yes. Okay, so you'd agree with me? Yes. She was using a walker and a cane. Yes. And she indicated that she uh, is able to walk in her, with, uh, within her home if she uses a walker or a cane. Yes. Okay. And if we look two pages later, 662. This is a note from the hospital, is that right? Yes. From 92818. I can't see the date on this. You see it at the top of the page under plan of care? No, I can now I can see it. Do you see it now? Yes. Is a plan of care put together for her? by Ms. Wolf on 928.18, right? Yes. Indicating that she uh, needs some needs supervision to stand, to sit. Yes. To toilet transfer. Yes. And recommendation, you see the assessment and recommendation? Yes. Patient not willing to get up and complete self-cares, she ambulated to commode at supervision. Yes. They instructed her on how to use adaptive equipment, including yes. like long uh, handled shoe horns, right? Yes. Things of that nature uh, and options that she had. Yes. And it, she's to be seen three to five times a week. Is that right? Yes. But you'd seen uh, her, throughout Lynn's records her complaining of uh, pain when she when she pain all the time in her back and in her hips is that right? No, I can't confirm that. All right. And you don't recall that from her other records from advanced pain management of complaints of back pain and hip pain. Of course, she was being treated by advanced pain management for those problems. So she had. Chronic back pain, chronic hip pain. Yes. Six ninety-two. Show you from the hospital, page six ninety-two. You didn't include the uh, consult in your notes with uh, Dr. White, did you? Um, it's not Dr. White. She's a therapist, and I did include it in my notes. Okay. So in 928, licensed social worker uh, White saw, saw Lynn. 923. 923. And that's when you, you have a, a couple notes in your chart that she's upset about her endoscopy and refuses it. You put in your chart, right? Did I say endoscopy? Yeah, endoscopy. Oh, you okay. See your chart? No, I I just was making sure because I know she also complained about her colonoscopy. So it doesn't say that. Um, okay. Okay. Um, talking about your note on your chart. Yes. Does not think anxiety or depression is affecting her, and you put that in quotes. Yes. And wants to go home now. She has diagnosis. Yes. Does not want to see a psychiatrist or take psych meds. 
Do you yes. remember that? Do you yes. want to see your chart? No, I, 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 I understand. That's all you wrote, Yes. correct? Yes. And I'm showing you the where you got that information from, right? Yes. This is the, the this is the report. She in in this report, Lynn. Uh, there's a record or a mention that Lynn had seen a psychiatrist at Aurora a few years ago. Is that right? Yes. Did this writer speak to the nursing staff? Yes. And they noted that her mentation is better today than it was yesterday. Yes. What's a mentation. Mental state. So meaning it was not, it, w it was worse the day before. Yes. They didn't say she's all better. She just said it's better. Yes. But continues to be odd. Yes. You didn't put that in your note that she was continuing to be odd. No. They said that she's refusing some tests, accepting others. Yes. Do you see in the, uh, in permission to publish this, Judge? Go ahead. <clears throat> see when it, I'm waiting for it to come up on the screens per usual. Jury can see it. Second paragraph. Writer briefly met with patient introducing self. Patient did participate in discussion with writer. Uh, patient, PT means patient, right? Yes. Uh, often answers specific questions with unrelated information. It is redirectable. Is that fair? Yes. You didn't put that in your, in your chart. No. For example, when writer asked patient if she's ever seen a psychiatrist or taking any taken any medications like an antidepressant, patient responds by providing a detailed complaint about her elderly father being given an antidepressant <coughs> and quickly going into a coma and dying. Is that what did I read that right? Yes. You didn't put that in your chart. No. Patient then recounts a promise she made to her father at age 16, assuring him that she'd never put him in a nursing home. Right? Yes. In one of his hospital stays, she picked him up from the hospital, brought him home, not knowing that her mother had signed him into a nursing home. Seems to be really fixated on nursing homes during this uh, conversation. Right? Yes. And then sometime later, the patient got a call from him yelling and screaming in the middle of the night, and the patient went to the nursing home and got him. Does that sound like what does that they wrote? Yes. That's what Lynn told them that day? Yes. And this writer, meaning uh, social worker Elizabeth White, he had uh, difficulty following the sequence of events. Yes. Patient has multiple stories focusing on mistreatment or poor treatment from the medical system to herself, to her parents, friends, etc. She also complains about some of the staff here at WMH, Waukesha Memorial Hospital, right? Yes. And but praises others. Did I read that right? Yes. None of that's in your chart. No. She says I don't uh, going down. Um, I, I I know I was a bitch to a nurse. Uh, she denies having any, having any concerns to substance abuse, saying, I don't drink, I don't smoke, I don't even drink coffee. It sounds like um, we know she was smoking. She was a smoker, right? Yes. That was not true. And you know from her other medical records, there was, um, doctor, that, that, that the subject of her smoking came up many, many times with her physicians. Yes. They always wanted to encourage her to quit smoking. True. And uh, they offer her help to quit smoking and she <clears throat> declined it. True. So this, she wasn't truthful. Right. So the patient says her memory is fine. 
She doesn't want to see a psychiatrist. She doesn't want to take psychiatric medications, right? Yes. But she's, she indicates in the third line from the bottom that she's mad that her doctor took away her pain pills and her sleeping pills. Yes. You didn't put that in here? No. But that sounds like somebody who is really fixated on pills. She's mad that they took away her pills. pills taking them away, they aren't prescribing them for her anymore, right? That's what it says, but she is getting a prescription for her um, sleeping pills. But she told them she's mad that they took them away from her. I see that. Okay. And you'd agree that her thought process uh, includes some loose associations, wouldn't you? It seems. I'm not going to affirm that. I could take that down. She was not giving all truthful information. You'd agree with that. True. It does seem like she was in a hurry to be discharged, doesn't it? Well, she definitely wanted to go home. And home is where she has her cigarettes, her alcohol, her all of her Objection. bottles of prescriptions. Move to strike. Sustained. Uh, rephrase. Well, she, ha she doesn't have cigarettes at the hospital. True? True. They don't let you smoke at Waukesha Memorial Hospital, do they? No. I don't think at any hospital. Okay. And she doesn't have any alcohol in the room. They don't, you can't order that on the menu at the hospital, can you? No. And she uh, doesn't have her pill bottles from home in her room at Waukesha Memorial Hospital. Correct. to some other records that you mentioned in your uh, chart that you gave us yesterday. Do you need those electronically with the witness? Yes. Okay. I'll start with the preview on for you and for the witness and let me know from there what you need. Advanced, we're going to look at the advanced pain management records. On your chart, you use, you refer to those as APM? Yes. And advanced pain management is a place where um, you can be, you would be referred to uh, if you're having pain, I assume. Manage your pain. Well, that's the purpose. Of, that's the purpose of a pain management clinic. Manage a person's pain. Yes. And Lynn was referred to uh, advanced pain management. That's right? Yes. And you first note the first visit on July 10th of 2017 <clears throat> is uh, what you first note. Is that right? I, I don't specifically recall. It would be whatever you is on the chart. And she went to see advanced pain management because she's having back pain, low back pain. Yes. And she's had uh, osteoarthritis in her lower lumbar spine since 1991. Yes. 
And she has weakness in her legs and numb, numbness and tingling. Yes. And at that uh, report, or uh, that visit, she, they indicate she is a current three PPD cigarette smoker. Is that packs per day? Yes. So three packs per day. Is that what that means? Yes. Is that a lot of cigarettes to smoke in a day? Yes. Okay. And at that, even at that, as early as that visit, um, the doctor noticed that she has anxiety, right? If that's what I wrote, yes. Yeah, you did. You wrote anxiety, insomnia, fatigue, alcohol use. That's what you put on your chart. Okay. Do you remember it? You prepared the chart. I can't remember what I put for every visit. That's why I did the chart. Do you have a copy of your chart in front of you? No. Well, if you ever want to see it, just let me know. <laughs> and so they reviewed, is it right, uh, her, her medications, and then they make decisions at advanced pain management about what kind of medications they're going to give her to, to that might give her some relief. Yes. And she followed up with them on August 1st of 2017. Reason on your chart is for back pain. The, right? Well, I, I mean, it sounds like you're making statements. Am I, am I supposed to agree with everything you say? Yes. Oh, okay. <laughs> yes, if that's what the chart says. You didn't indicate anywhere on the chart that patient describes, can we bring this up? Page 32. Page 32 of exhibit. What is the exhibit number? 540. It's not been offered yet. Do you want to establish that with this witness or is there any kind of stipulation, Attorney Nicola? Do you see this uh, sheet of hers at the front? I can show, I will show the doctor the first page of that exhibit 540. Do you see, is that in your screen yet? Yes. Can you see that, um, is this the, a copy of the records that you received at your office from Advanced Pain Man Management on January 20th? Or is this the request you made? This is the request. That you made to uh, Advanced Pain Management January 24th of 2019, is that right? Yes. All right, and the, for Lynn Hernan's records. Yes. And that is, it consists of 30, 39 pages. Can we show you? Do you want okay. us to flip through it? Sure. Okay, we'll do that. Does that look like the, are those the records that you received in yes. response to your request? Yes. And I, did you see that I marked it as Exhibit 540? Uh, I see, yes. Thank you, uh, Your Honor. I move for admission of 540. No objection. Hey. Thank you. Exhibit 540 is received. Now I would like to show the next uh, visit, which is on August 1st, 2017, 32. page 30, starts on page 32 of Exhibit 540. Do you see her uh, back pain described as shooting, tingling, deep, heavy, achy? Yes. Your description on your chart was back pain, is that right? Yes. There's weakness in her low back, hip, shoulders, and right knee. She has night pain. Yes. Do you see that? Yes. 
The pain interferes with her sleep, her daily activities, work, makes her feel frustrated. Is that right? Yes. And the pain today, and according to how she describes it on a scale of 1 to 10, today is a 5 out of 10. Yes. Uh, worst, on her worst days, is 10 out of 10. Second line. I see, yes. Currently, though, it's 5 out of 10. Yes. And that's just a, a, that's a, a way a person can tell the doctor how bad the pain feels to them. Is that what that means? Yes. And the doctor reviewed her, her systems. On next page. Yes. Did a did an exam. Yes. They looked at some imaging. Uh, uh, next page, MRI of the lumbar spine. They were there to review the MRI. Is that right? Yes. She apparently had one. And there were a lot of problems, right? Do you see that? Yes. What, 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 what I'm were sorry, her I touched the screen. Oh, that's all right. Okay. What are what are the problems that were noted on the imaging? Distal thoracic cord syrinx, mine, mild annular disc bulging without substantial central canal or neural foraminal narrowing L3-4. Left facet arthropathy is increased with no central canal stenosis or neural foraminal stenosis L4-5. Moderate facet and ligamentum flavum hypertrophy is present. No central canal or neural foraminal stenosis L5-S1. No disc bulge or, herniation or disc herniation. Facet arthropathy without central canal or neural foraminal stenosis. So she's got some problems in her back. Yes. And I think you testified yesterday that eventually they give her an injection to help relieve some of that pain. Is that right? Yes. And you said that her Owestry score is 31 out of 50. Is that true? At one point. Is that on this visit? I don't see it. We're at what I'm looking at. I don't know if you see it. Well, I see it on your chart, so I'm trying to figure out oh, where... Oh, for this day? Well, look, can I, can I see more of this page? Sure. Can you show her more of the page? Page 33. Page All the way down. <coughs> Here. Here it is at the bottom yes. of page 33. Yes, I see that. It's 31 out of 50. Correct. <coughs> it indicates moderate functional impairment. Correct. And these scores are out of 50. Yes. Is that how you do these scales? Third out of 50, is that how it's always done? I don't know that much about the Orestry score. I looked it up to understand what this was, but 31 out of 50 is what it says. Well, you, you, you talked about it several times yesterday. I'm just trying to get a little more information about this Orestry score. I think the significance is that it was marked in the chart three times, 35 out of 50, 31 over 50, and the last one was a single digit out of 50. So it was a way to measure her functional ability as determined by these health care providers. Right, let's look at that last one that was single digit out of 50. Oh, page, I see. Page mm -hmm. 3. Yes. We'll just oh, bring that 4 up. out of 10. Well, you said it was out of 50. You're right. You said that's, that yesterday, too. That's wrong. It's 4 out of 10. I made, an, I made a mistake. I made a mistake in the number. It still indicates no functional impairment, according to their assessment. Maybe they made this mistake. I don't know. But 4 out of 10 is what it reads. Now, looking at the next visit, uh, going back uh, forward in time, 
with the advanced pain management visits. I look at the visit from October 9th of 2017, page 18 of the exhibit. And there, the severity level for her back pain is moderate to severe, is that right? Yes. And then going to the next visit, which is December 4th of 2017, page 14. You indicate on you when you put your chart together that she's there, that she's experiencing back pain. Yes. On the on the uh, actual record on page fourteen, she's her pain level is moderate to severe. Is that right? Yes. Patient described the pain as ache, sharp, shooting, stabbing. Do you see that? Yes. You didn't put that in your chart. The description of the pain, did you? No. Symptoms are aggravated by daily activities and relieved by movement. Do you see that? I do. Her pain score, she rates as 6 out of 10. Is that true? Currently, it was 6 out of 10, yes. And then if we look at the next page, 15, there's some diagnoses over at the top on the right side. Uh, do you see those? Um, those look like complications of her um, allergies. Complications of her allergies? Could you go to the page before this, 14? Sure. And go to the bottom? Yep, to her allergies. The di yes, dis so it's a continuation. So it says allergy on the left, and yep. it says reaction on the right. Is that her reaction? Yes. So her reaction to cortisone is incontinence? That's what it says. Okay. I, you have to go to the next page now. I don't have that page. All right, let's let's bring up that okay. next page. So, are these statements that are over on the right side? Uh, can we publish this? Go ahead. We can see that now. Do you see uh, over on the right side at the top? Are these this what you're saying? Telling us these are the complications Lynn experiences from these drugs. That's what it, it's written down as. Yes. Well, this is her medical record, right? Yes. So, she what, what is anaphylaxis? Um, cardiovascular collapse as a result of an allergic reaction. So she has some history of that, apparently. Yes. Incontinence is going not being able to hold in your pee, right? Or um, fecal incontinence versus urinary incontinence, it doesn't say. Okay. She has a history of lungs collapsed. That's what it says. And weight gain? Yes. Shortness of breath? Yes. Salt weeping from all orifices and decreased hearing? Yes. What are orifices? Generally, it's considered all entry into the body. That would include eyes, nose, mouth, rectum, urethra, vagina. Okay. And loose stools. Review of symptoms. Did they review her eyes? Review of symptoms. Can you go down? Yes. Do you see it was positive? Yes. They put either negative or positive in the column, right? Correct. If there's, a, if, if there's a problem, they say positive, negative means no problem. Correct. So for eyes, dry eyes, eye pain. Correct. So there is indication of eye pain. Yes. Does that help you remember that there's eye pain in Lynn's history? Yes. And on page 14, going back to page 14, you see her back pain. It's changing, right? 
the problem is changing in character. Yes. Okay. Now it's daily. I'm looking for that. It occurs persistently. So, uh, third, third sentence. Okay, it occurs persistently, yes. As opposed to previously when we were seeing intermittently, right? I don't recall. Page 16 of the same visit. Did, did they do an assessment of her at this visit? Yes. And she's been referred for osteoarthritis in her lower lumbar spine since 1991. Is that right? Correct. She, there's weakness in her legs. Is that true? Yes. Numbness and tingling in BL legs. Is that bilateral? Yes. Meaning both legs. Yes. Pain is aggravated by all her ADLs. Is that the activities of daily life? Yes. That, that means. And relieved by swimming and medication. Yes. Do you see that she was there for a follow-up OV office visit? Next paragraph. Yes. Uh, Lynn took the hyd hydrocodone for a month, breaking the two tablets in half to space out the dosing throughout her day. Yes. They talk about she's getting alprazolam for her primary care physician for, for sleep and anxiety, right? Yeah, right. And this doctor says when taken together, this can increase her risk of respiratory depression and mortality threefold. Yes. I didn't see that in your chart. No. So this doctor then indicates that he spoke with her primary care physician a few weeks ago, and he's going to stop the hydrocodone so that the primary care physician can continue to prescribe the alprazolam for the anxiety and sleep without the concurrent risk. Right. And you saw that in her Aurora records, didn't you? We kind of briefly yes. touched on it. One yes. of her doctors dropped her. Yes. Because of these multiple <coughs> prescriptions. Her urine screen didn't pass muster for the Aurora doctor. Right. And that doctor made a point of calling advanced pain management to talk about it, right? It, you remember reading that in the record that Aurora called advanced pain management, or don't you remember that? Well, this part of the record says that this nurse provider is talking with her PCP a few weeks ago but I don't know who called who. Okay. And we'll be stopping the hydrocodone. All right. And then she sees the advanced pain management again uh, on January 29th of 2018. We'll bring up that record. That's going to be page 10. And on your chart, you have you you made a mention that she did go to that visit, and again, back pain. Right? Yes. But you did say back pain is worse. Yes. And that's accurate because that um, is in the record. Severity level uh, at this visit is moderate to severe. It's worsening, she says. Yes. It occurs persistently. Yes. The pain is shooting and stabbing. Yes. Symptoms are aggravated by daily activities and the patient denies relieving factors, meaning nothing is, makes it go away. Yes. If we look at the next page 11, can you show that next page? They looked at, uh, they talked to her about her eyes again, and again, she's positive for dry eyes and eye pain. Yes. So this is now two visits in a row of eye pain. Yes. Mm -hmm. And the next page of 12, they did a physical exam on Lynn, and on the constitutional patient is obese. Do you see that? Yeah. Yes. It also talks 
further down on that page that there's an opioid risk. Yes. And she signed a controlled substance agreement on September 26 of 2017, right? Yes. And at this visit, they assessed her risk as low. Yes. Uh, but I, she had... I, I can't really see it, though. Oh, can you bring it down a little? There we go. Is that better? Yes. And when people are receiving controlled substance opioids, oftentimes you do have to sign an agreement. Is that right? Yes. And agreeing that you're not going to abuse the pills. I presume. I haven't read one. And at this point, they thought her, her risk was low for yes. abuse. Yes. And you indicated in your chart, and you could see it in the record, that the issues um, that, that are noted are her continued anxiety, her insomnia, uh, and her back pain is worse. And then plus the, the eye pain. Is that right? I, well, I, if you say it's on the chart, I'll agree with you. Or do you, can you see it in the record? What section would you want to look at? Because it's in your it's in your note. I guess well, we make a record of what's being published. Page eleven. Page eleven. <clears throat> of all the things you mentioned, I see the eye pain, the dry eyes, abdominal pain. I, I don't know all the things you mentioned, and all right. and what part of the chart they're from. It's, we have just uh, two more days to go through, Your Honor. Very good. Okay. Uh, we'll draw your attention now to the February 28, 2018 visit on page 6. Do you have that in front yeah. of you? Yes. Now this record indicates that the severity level for her back pain is moderate, is that right? Yes. Uh, the problem is stable. It occurs persistently. Do I read that right? Yes. Location of pain is lower back, re radiated to the bilateral hips. So would you agree with me now that the pain was in her, had moved to her hips? Yes. She dis the patient describes the pain as ache, deep, discomforting, piercing, shooting, stabbing. Is that right? Yes. And the, they're relieved Right, by movement and pain meds and drugs. Yes. Her pain score she rates as a 5 out of 10 and at worst a 9. Yes. <clears throat> if we look at the next page, which is a review of symptoms, let's look and see what her eyes were like. Positive again for dry eyes and eye pain. Yes. Under psych, on that page, do you see that section positive for psych, under psych? Yes. And they note that she has anxiety and insomnia. Yes. If you, we'll show you page nine of that report. And do you see at the top that she's long-term current use of opiate analge analgesic at the top? Oh, yes. Do you see on the plan that she's going to establish a new primary care physician who patient reports will not be writing benzos for her? Yes. Benzos, is that the benzodiazepine? Benzos are short for benzodiazepine. This doctor is saying you could consider a low dose of hydrocodone, is that right? Yes. If she's not on the benzos. Correct. And then he's starting her on back, or she's starting her on baclofen. Yes. Offered a retrial of physical therapy, but she declines. 
Yes. Offered a referral to pain psychologist, declines. Yes. Offered nutrition services for healthy eating, declines. Yes. Medical necessity screening. Patient is a moderate risk level for receiving controlled substances. Do you see that? Yes. And in accordance with the standard of care, I am ordering this medically necessary urine toxology test to confirm compliance with the treatment plan. Yes. So now she has become a moderate risk, right? Yes. And last visit is February. We'll move to <coughs> Well, you saw, uh, looking at that last uh, visit, you did, you do know that she had hyd hyd hydrocodone uh, on her death toxology. Yes. It was in her system. Yes. Even though doctors took her off of opioids. That before her hospitalization, they took her off of opioids. Well, because of the benzoyl she took for her anxiety sleep. Correct. Okay. But it's in her system. Yes. At her death. Yes. And then she saw uh, the last record that you have we have is March 14th of 2018, and that's page two. I didn't see that in your chart. Did you not include that one? Oh, I'm sorry, it's March 14th. I see it. My apologies. March 14th. Do you see that record in front of you? Yes. And now, then reports the severity level is moderate. The problem's worsening. It occurs persistently. We've heard that before, right? Yes. Pain is ache, discomforting, piercing, shooting. It's aggravated by sitting too long and stretching. It's relieved by different prescriptions and walking and topical creams. Is that right? Yes. Her pain is 5 out of 10. Yes. And if we look at the next page, which is 3 on the record, when they reviewed her symptoms, let's look at her, uh, her review of symptoms. They just put the positive ones in here. Is that right? Yes. Sometimes they put the negatives, but not this one. She's positive for... Tinnitus? Yes. Ringing in the ears, right? Yes. And positive for dry eyes again and eye pain. Yes. So she, she really is having eye pain every time she goes to the doctor. Yes. She's also positive for anxiety and insomnia, back pain, joint pain, and easy bruising. Is that right? Yes. And then page four... <laughs> The opioid risk assessment now, in the middle of the page, is moderate. Yes. And that's based on her behavior history. Yes. And what is that next thing, ORT? I don't know what it stands for. What's the, the diagnosis is a pain disorder with related psychological factors. Is that true? Diagnosis, last one. That's what it says. Well, that's what the doctor diagnosed her with, right? Yes. Pain disorder with related psychological factors. Yes. And the plan is would avoid, skipping down, would avoid using opioids in this patient for as she is currently taking a benzo and had alcohol in her last UDS despite her reported rare social drinking. Yes. You didn't mention that in your chart. Not that statement, no. They encouraged her to decrease her smoking. Is that right? Yes. Offered her physical therapy, but she declines again. Yes. Offered a referral to a pain psych uh, psychologist. She, she refused, declines. Yes. yes. 
and offered nutrition services, but she declines at this office visit as well. Yes. She doesn't want any help, those things. Right. Okay, thank you. Judge, I think it would be a good break time. Great. Thank you. All right, ladies and gentlemen of the jury, uh, we will break for our lunch hour. We will take the 90 minutes. Uh, and uh, just a reminder, while you are out at lunch, even though you are in the jury room, please do not do any research. Do not discuss this case among yourselves. Uh, please avoid doing all of the things that I have advised you about uh, over the last couple of days already. Um, and otherwise, have a good lunch. You are excused. All rise for the jury. Thank you. Be seated. I do have one sidebar to put on the record. Uh, Dr. B, you may step down if you would like. Attorney Nikolai had an objection, asked for a sidebar. Uh, it was during the course of publishing what ultimately was received as Exhibit 541. That is the very large 1,325 pages. It's technically 1,326 because there's a cover page. Uh, to the exhibit, but the specific objection at this point was to uh, some, what I would call hearsay within hearsay of statements attributed to uh, Ms. Kershevsky and being offered by her own attorneys. That would not be proper. She's not a party opponent, obviously, and so I did indicate I would sustain that um, and did when we came back on the record. Um, I gave some instructions, if you will, to the parties that I thought the witness could be questioned about certain things in there without calling for that hearsay within hearsay. Um, there was also an objection uh, regarding referring to uh, Ms. Hernan as an alcoholic or having alcoholism because of the lack of a diagnosis within any of the documents. And again, I indicated that would be sustained and that would not be appropriate, but there could be questions based on actual information. And I think the parties have done a very good job since that time of complying uh, with that. Um, I did verify that these were records, and it came out during the questioning later, that the records were provided by the state to the defense. Again, I'm talking about Exhibit 541. Attorney Kukler made that very clear. Uh, and then ultimately, um, I believe that was received, right? Or no? I think 540 is received, but I wasn't clear on 541. I take that back. You're right. 540 was the um, one that were just being discussed from advanced pain management. I'm not sure if there was actually a request. The original request was sustained, and then I don't think there was a second one. Uh, and then just a reminder, um, we marked the drops, the bottles, but they have not been offered yet. So would offer, um, that's fine. I'm sure you're going to want to do it in front of the jury, though. Oh, yeah, so I just, so. it's just my reminder. Um, maybe write it on a post-it note if you need, and we'll give it to you. But that has not happened yet. All right. Uh, anything, Attorney Kukler, you would want to add to the sidebar? Thank you. All right, Attorney Nikolai, anything about the sidebar? No, thank you. All right, everyone, um, we'll see you back. I've, sh I've shortened your lunch to instead of 90 minutes to 85, but please be back here. Thank you. We are in recess.
Back on the record in State versus Kershevsky. Appearances are as they were before. We're all back here after the lunch hour. Dr. B, I was shorting it, sorry, because I never say it right. <laughs> I try. Bidzricki. Bidzricki. Say it again. <laughs> Bidzricki. Bidzricki. That's what throws me. I hear it other ways. But in any event, uh, I know our jurors are here. They didn't leave during the lunch hour, so we'll bring them out. I need to write that phonetically. Tritsky. There you go. I'll have it now. There you go. But I think for so long there's been a mispronunciation and it's kind of stuck in my head. <laughs> My little secret, that's why I just say doctor. <laughs> <laughs> I know I need Lori for the phonetics. So Jeffrey, I'm going to for the Polish. Anything I can uh, throw away up there? Yeah. Or that wasn't yours? I don't know if this was mine or not. So All right. I'll, I'll just check on it. We'll get rid of it. Go ahead. Thank you, Adam. Mm -hmm. It was open. I don't even know if anyone ever drank it, but I think you got enough. So we'll oh, yeah. <laughs> Thank you, everyone. Please be seated. Dr. Bidricki, you understand and you acknowledge you remain under oath. I do. All right. Go ahead, Attorney Kukler. You may continue. All right. A um, couple housekeeping matters before I start. I think that uh, my staff uh, reported that I didn't offer Exhibit 541, so I would offer 541 into evidence. Thank you. Any objection? No. Thank you. Exhibit 541 is received. Those are the pro health records. And then, um, Your Honor, I'm offering 584, which was a box of eye drops. Any objection? No. Exhibit 584 is also received. Did you bring the prescription bottles back with you this afternoon? No, and I'm sorry if I didn't understand that it was a, a I thought it was a theoretical request and I didn't bring them. But if, if at some point you would like me to call my staff, I can. Yes, I thought I said, could you get those during oh. the break? Oh, I'm sorry. I didn't understand that. If I didn't make it clear, could, uh, you will be able to call somebody to bring them over? Yes. All right. Yes, I do want them. Should I, like, leave the courtroom to make this call? We could talk about something else or I could make the call. I believe, uh, Attorney Nicolai, might be trying to facilitate. We can facilitate that. Great, thank but you. My, my staff won't know where they are in my office. Oh, oh. oh. then no. <laughs> <laughs> could um, we just take a couple minutes so she could make the call and get that going? S certainly. If you, um, I don't know if that door behind her is, well, you can either step off or you can go behind, it, whatever you want to do. And we'll be off the record. Okay.
We are back on the record then, and uh, Dr. did just indicate to me, in case anyone didn't hear, that they are coming. So thank you for doing that. Go ahead, Attorney Kukler. I'm going to uh, go back to a couple more questions on uh, the pro-health records that we looked at earlier, uh, Exhibit 541. Could I, uh, well, we're going to bring up page 508 for the record. Oops, sorry. We were both doing that, Teresa. And we could publish this. Go ahead. On the jury will let us know when it. See, sometimes it's much quicker. Do you see uh, this note from Dr. Klaas, K-L-A-A-S, from 9-15-2018? Yes. And that is the day that Lynn uh, was admitted into the hospital, is that right? Yes. And do you see the section called code status? Yes. Discussed with the patient extensively. Yes. She wants DNR. What does that stand for? Do not resuscitate. She doesn't want to be resuscitated, is that right? Yes and made it clear that in, in the event of cardiopulmonary arrest, if her heart stops, right? Yes. Do not, in capital letters, perform resuscitation, such as chest compression, shock, or intubation. Is that right? Yes. Okay. And so she went in the hospital with that, um, telling them she didn't want to be resuscitated. Yes. She told them. Then on that record, I want to also show you, uh, I just want to show the witness, though. <coughs> okay. I don't want to publish page 707 of the record. Do you see that in front of you? Hospital yes. day four? Yes. It's a nursing note from a registered nurse, is that right? Yes. Do you see that she, uh, Lynn indicates, uh, she talks about her friend Jennifer Flower as being a first agent? Yes. And that, and she met with, um, she met with Jesse as well, is that right? Yes. With permission? Yes. And at this point, uh, she, you, you the record uh, indicates that Lynn began using a walker leading up to her up to her admission for weakness. Is that fair? Yes. And she hadn't been eating. Yes. She claims that for three to four years she's lived off soup and liquids. Is that right? Yes. But that doesn't make sense with the significant change in weight that a person would just be living living off soup. Well, she admitted eating bologna, mashed potatoes, and Chinese food that I put in my chart. So. I see. So then this, is, this would be a lie. I don't want to characterize it that way, but I know it. she ate more than soup. Even though she's saying that she's living off soup, you know she ate more. Well, that's because you're believing that when she said to a doctor that she ate bologna and felt sick, that that was true. That is true. She might have lied about the bologna, too. That's possible. Now, in this note, isn't it true that the, the nurse wants Lynn to have 24-hour caregiver to meet her needs? Yes. And if, if she can't have a 24-hour caregiver, she needs to go to be discharged to a skilled nursing facility. Yes. And so you can see in this note that she, and you know she did get released to home, right? Yes. And that there were um, friends, uh, Jesse and Jennifer, uh, that she's requested that they never place her anywhere besides her home. Is that right? I'm going to object and ask for a sidebar about this 
questioning, please. All right. The objection from the state is sustained. I'm also going to strike from the record, which means the jury shall disregard uh, a, what was an indication that it was the deceased Lynn Hernan for the past three to four years patient has lived off soup and liquids due to GI intolerance. That statement you are not to uh, consider in any way. It's being struck from the record as evidence. Go ahead. Looking at that same page, would you would you tell us what the discharge plan was for Lynn? Uh, you would like me to read that entire paragraph? 
No, I'm, you don't have to read the entire paragraph, but if you want to indicate what the <coughs> discharge plan was, was it uh, whether it was to be into a skilled nursing facility or discharge to home, 24-hour uh, caregivers, whatever you think is uh, important from the discharge plan. Um, the last sentence, or the second last sentence, I provided education that the patient at this point would need 24-hour caregiver to meet her needs, and if they are unable to provide that, patient will need to discharge to a skilled nursing facility. Okay, then we can stop there. I see the next page. And showing you the next page on that note, was that, who, who, who was that plan discussed with? Uh, Jesse Kershewski. Oh, 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 I'm sorry, uh, Dr. Chan and Ashley are in. Well, what's the first person's listed? Jesse Kershewski. No. Oh, just, patient, I'm sorry. Yes, patient. Plan was discussed with the patient. Yes. Jesse, Dr. Chan, and a nurse, Ashley. Is that right? Yes. Okay, thank you. So as a physician, a note like that, in a record suggests, that, can we take that down, please? Yep. That uh, the, the patient needs 24-hour care. Is that right? Yes. And you don't have any reason to dispute that <coughs> note? No. And if the patient can't have 24-hour home nursing care, the physicians who were treating her felt she needed to be in a a nursing home, is that right? A skilled nursing facility. D does that include a nursing home when we it use may, that? Yeah. Is that term? All right. I would like to talk to you about the Aurora Records, which is Exhibit 539. Keep <coughs> some of the Aurora records, is that right? Yes. I think this is slipped down, there we go. And if I look at fi uh, Exhibit 539, do you have that in front of you? Yes. First page of it seems to be a letter from your office dated January 24, 2019 to Aurora Healthcare requesting records. Yes. So although you did the autopsy in October 3rd of 2018, you didn't actually request her Aurora records for months. Yes. More than three months, almost four months later. Yes. Can we show the exhibit? You see our exhibit sticker 539? Yes. We'll just page through it really quick so you can make sure it's complete. You want to see all 170, do you agree it was 175 pages? Um, I don't know the count. All right. We'll go to the end. You can see the counter on the Yes. Right. Yeah. You agree that says 175? Yes, I do agree. Okay. Okay. Move for admission of exhibit. Five thirty nine. Any objection? No. Exhibit five thirty nine is received. And you went through the Aurora records on that chart, exhibit two ten that you showed yesterday as well. Is that right? Yes. Pulled out the uh, information that you thought was important. Yes. And it looks like you began your review. Well. When you requested the records from Aurora, you requested, um, if I look at, if we look at page one, could we publish now at this point? Go page, ahead. 
page one, you requested Lynn's records relating to her treatment, including most recent H and P. What's H and P? History and physical. Yes. Current medication list, diagnosis list, and physician office visit notes from the last two years. Is that right? Yes. You didn't want to see anything before two years. That's all you need, really need, or thought you needed. That's all I thought I needed to start. And you began your review with 221.17 in your chart that you, and that's the first record that's that's been given from them too. Is that true? Uh, um, oh, you can show that. Page yeah. Page two? Yes. Okay. Is that right? Yes. Okay. So page, yeah, page two. Page one. And looking at page two, do you see at the top uh, under medication the last item listed is artificial tears? Yes. Because already noting, uh, and this is your first record, that this eye issue with Lynn was happening even back then. Yes. And you don't have that mentioned on your 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 uh, chart, do you? No. But this case really is a lot about eye drops, isn't it? Yeah. Well, yes, it could be. Okay. And if we look at page page eight of the record, it's up in front of you. Would you agree that in the middle of the page in bold is a indication that Lynn has anxiety? Yes. There is a discussion on the side effects of taking benzos and opioids. Is that right? Yes. And the increased risk of morbidity. Does that mean death? No. Or what is morbidity getting? What does that mean? Um, illness. Illness. Because it's dangerous to take opioids and benzos together. Yes. You'd agree that you have personally, as a, as a uh, medical examiner here, had any number of deaths that you've uh, seen yourself where people have died from that combination. That's true. Opioids and benzoid, benzos. That's true. And if we look at the next page, page nine of the record, do you see a progress note by Dr. Sama, S A M E H, at the bottom? I can't see the note. Okay. Do you see it now? Yes. What does it note say? Uh, Lynn Hernan is a 60-year-old female who is here for medication follow-up. She needs refills of her hydrocodone and alprazolam. She states later she needs everything refilled. She reports she is using an OTC eardrop for ear ringing that is the results of the Zofran use last summer. So she wants everything in quotes. The quotes means that's what the words that the that the patient used, right? Yes. She wants everything refilled. Is that right? Yes. And that's not, you didn't make a note of that on your chart. You didn't really think that was important to mention. Um, if I didn't make a note of it, no. Nor did you think it was important to talk about the dangers and the side effects of the benzos and the opioids in that discussion. You didn't think that was worth mentioning to the jury. Well, that's not true. I might not have put it on the chart, but I know for sure I mentioned it in my testimony yesterday. Okay. Then she came back to see doctor on 523 of 17, and we'll look at uh, a note on uh, page 21. You, your your chart says she's there for a med refill, ROS negative. Review of symptoms? Or, yes. Uh, I'm sorry. Review of? S systems. Systems is negative. 
Do you see the note that we have up here? Due to her pain, all she does is sit around and smoke. Yes. Sometimes up she, sometimes she up to three packs per day! Exclamation point! Right? Yes. She's gained six pounds since February. Yes. And then there's a, and that's where you gathered her weight from from this from this visit too. Is that true? I don't see it yet on the on my exhibit. On next picture. And you converted the ninety six point one kilograms. Is that right? Is that yes. how you do that? Okay. And you put it into pounds. Correct. And then on page twenty three of that progress note. Do you see her anxiety? The, the note that she has anxiety. Yes. And they talk about her prescriptions for alprazolam for for sleep or anxiety, trouble sleeping, giving number thirty with two refills, right? Yes. And chronic low back back pain. And yes. And persistent asthma, and gastroesophageal reflux <coughs> disease. And yep. restless leg syndrome, and hypothyroidism, and hypertension. Are these some of the diagnoses for her? Yes. And then she came back in, uh, page 30 of the record, on 622. Is that still 622? Uh, no, 622, and now she comes in for foot pain, is that right? Yes. And she claims that that uh, has been going on for three years. Yes. And then, does it seem that she goes back the next day on 623? The next day from 629? Or page 39. She's back at the doctor the next day for heart palpitations, is that right? Well, 623 is not the next day from 629. I thought we were on 622 before. Well, 620, let me go back to the um, doctor with the foot pain. Could you, yeah. Can you go at the top there? I thought it said visit oh, yes. 622. Oh, yeah. I'm sorry. Five I'm sorry if I got it wrong. No, no. It's okay. a, I looked at the progress notes. It says 629, right. but the encounter was 622. Very yes. good. Yes. Okay. Can we move to page 39? So she went back the next day. Is that right? Yes. And now she has worse anxiety, heart palpitations. She's uh, cooped up in her house doing nothing. Is that right? I can't see that. See it there? Yes. Of page 39? Yes. Is that right? Yes. And she's complaining of worsening anxiety now? Yes. Cooped up in her house doing nothing? Yes. Page 40, as it continues down, she had an episode of supposed leg weakness. Is that right? Yes. And she's tried. Uh, Effects her in the past, and she states this has made her very mean. Do you see that? Yes. She's asking to restart a, a prescription for diazepam. Yes. Uh, she's complaining of GI issues. She indicates that she can eat only very little. Did she tell the doctor that? It looks that way. Yet she's gained 30 pounds since December. Yes. And we have a visit with Aurora on 818 of 2017, page 49 of the record. She's still complaining of, uh, she's there to follow up on her anxiety, is that right? Yes. She couldn't tolerate the Lexapro. Yes. 
She feels her anxiety is unchanged. She feels all bound up. Yes. All other medications are working well and she desires refills. Yes. She still complains about GI problem and digesting food, but she hasn't followed up with GI. Yes. At page 50, part of that same visit, when they talk about her appearance, She's described as moderately obese and dressed too old for her age. Yes. Is that kind of consistent with how you, when you were talking about, you know, that she was older yesterday and then you said, well, but I'm that same age, but she's, she seems older. No, that's not what I said. I okay. said she needed rehabilitation after being in bed for two weeks is as common with older people. And then I referred to my own age, which was probably not relevant. And then we have a visit on page 62 of a Medicare wellness visit. We'll bring that up. Do you see that? Yes. Lynn presents for her Medicare wellness visit. She has complaints or concerns which include numerous, in capital letters, exclamation point. Do you see that what the physician uh, wrote? Yes. So many complaints, numerous. And that's November 7th of 2017. Yes. And if we look at page 65, we can see at the bottom that she is there for medication follow-up. She wants refills for her alprazolam, among other things. Is that right? Correct. She complains that her mouth burns. She can only drink soup broth. Yes. She also reports that pain management started her on Norco for her back pain. The doctor did not have any concerns about it in quotation marks. Yes. Well, why, do you, why would that have been significant enough for, for the physician to have noted that in, in this record? Well, because Norco is an opioid. Okay. So we have to be concerned about opioids. Yes. He must have been concerned, and she was telling him that her, her doctor didn't have any concerns. The doctor wasn't a him, but... You know, that's because she's on benzos, right? Yes. And page 66, at the very bottom, the psych area, she's very argumentative today. Yes. She seems to be depressed and talks about having nothing since her parents died a few years ago. Yes. You see that? Mm -hmm. Yes. You didn't make any mention of that in your, your chart, did you? I think I might have. I don't see my chart. Do you have it? Uh, I could find it for you later. Page okay. 67. <coughs> Do you see the um, anxiety note? Yes. Doctor told, spoke with Lynn and said it's unsafe to take the alprazolam and the narco today. There's a nine times higher risk of cardiac death if she continues to take the narco. I will not refill the alprazolam as I cannot put my license at risk. Do you see that? Yes. Is that true that there is a nine times higher risk of cardiac death if she takes that? I don't know the number. So you're not disputing what he has written? No. She gets very mad at me and says, I am the one who referred her to pain management, and pain management is the one who gave her the Norco. So why can't she take both? Is that right? Did I read that right? Yes. I told her that I do not feel she should have been given the Norco due to the risks. Lynn said sleep is more important to her, so she will not refill the Norco. Right? Yep. And then this doctor did call Sarah McGrath, NP, and we've seen that note. That is the person over at Advanced Pain Management, right? Right. So now that would refresh your recollection that Aurora doctor did call over at Advanced Pain Management. True? That's true. And... Sarah McGrath, and, and, I mean, sorry, Dr. Sama talked to Advanced Pain Management about, about um, her concerns uh, with Lynn. Right? Yes. 
Sarah, Sarah, when they refer to Sarah in this note, that's Sarah over at the Advanced Pain Management. Yes? I believe so. Sarah said she was aware of the increased risk of respiratory depression and sudden cardiac death, but Lynn was very forceful about doing something for her pain. Did you see that note? Yes. Do you think that's significant? This information? Yes. That Lynn really wants her pain pills. She wants her medications, right? Yes. And so this doctor gave her a 30-day supply of the Alprazolam, and said she, and then Lynn says she won't fill her next prescription in Norco, right? Right. This doctor wants her to go see someone new for a therapist, but she refuses. Is that true? Yes. And given her anxiety, I do believe she would benefit. She also has depression that she refuses other medication for. Is that accurate? Did I read that right? Yes. <clears throat> do you recall that? Just one moment, please. to show you page 96 of the record, which is an eye exam from December 8th of 2017. Also on your chart. You did put that on your chart. Do you have that in front of you? Yes. Patient was in the hospital and was given too much Zofran and it affected her vision. Can Zofran do that? I was not aware of that. She noted she had lost her peripheral vision, saw flashing lights in her vision, and then her eyes became very dry, burning, and irritated. Did you see that? Yes. I don't see on your chart that her eyes were dry, burning. Oh, I see dry, but I don't see that you wrote down burning and irritated. Is burning significant? It's an additional symptom with dry eyes. Well, it shows some pain. Okay. True? True. And she was recommended to take uh, artificial, Walgreens brand artificial tears at least four times a day. Yes. Of course, it can be any brand. Yes. It doesn't have to be Walgreens, right? Correct. It could be, for example, the ones that we found that were found at our home, which we showed you before. They were tears. Yes. For example. And then uh, I will show you what's page 104 of the record, which is an urgent care visit. On February 1st of 2018. And Lynn, you see it in front of you? Yes. Lynn presented for, cons for concerns of what? Abdominal pain. How did she describe the pain? She described it in the upper part of her abdomen, epigastric area. And uh, continue? The pain started Sunday, 2 a.m., describes the pain as sharp, thinks it may be related to what ate, bologna, peas. Okay, so she describes the pain as sharp, and she thinks it might be from bologna and peas. Is that right? Yes. She rates the pain at 5 to, out of 10 now, but it was 10 out of 10 for the last four nights, according to this record. Is that true? Yes. And she's had that pain for four days. Yes. And welts, do you see on her urinary welts on her left side legs since Sunday? Yes. 
What were those from? I don't know. Do you get welts from allergic reaction? You can. Did it turn out that she was allergic to various medications? Yes. Page 122 of the record. Do you see a visit from 2718 complaining of right foot pain? Yes. Lynn requested a cortisone injection, is that right? Yes. Indicates she's in, in uh, pain management. Yes. Lynn was seen at the Lakeshore Medical Clinic. She doesn't always seen at the same clinics, right? Is it very? I didn't notice the site of the visits. Okay. In any event, on 2718, she's seen at Lakeshore Medical Clinic, Moreland on page 134 of this record. Do you see that? Yes. That's a Miss Geagle? Yes. She's there for medication management, is that right? Yes. On page 135 of that record, <coughs> they didn't address some of the risks that they, that they thought they needed to. They didn't address major depressive bipolar and paranoid disorders, is that right? Yes. And chronic obstructive pulmonary disease. Right. COPD sometimes we call that, right? Yes. And on that visit, do you see that she complains of gaining 25 pounds since she last was seen? Yes. And then she was seen, when, who, which doctor did she see at that visit? Dr. Sema. Okay. And then on March 7, 2018, page 145 of the record, do you see that? Yes. It's uh, March 7th, 18. Which doctor does she see at this visit? Abdullah. And this is to establish care, is that right? Yes. She was discharged from the primary, previous primary care physician. We've touched on that before. This is the record of it, right? Yes. And so now she's getting a new doctor. True? Yes. 146, they talk about her... Um, impression and a plan, and again noted anxiety, chronic insomnia, history of major de major depression, COPD, and hy uh, post-surgical hypo hypothyroidism. Is that what, am I reading that right? I don't have page 146 up. Oh, sorry. There it is. Down here. You see the impression plan and counter to establish care? Yes. Is that right? She's got anxiety, chronic insomnia, history of major depression, COPD, and post-surgical hypothyroidism. Correct. And you'd agree that even the chronic insomnia is another um, disorder that's in the DSM. I don't know if it's in the DSM. I don't use the DSM. Well, because you've been talking, you talked yesterday about whether there was psychological things going on with Ms. Vernon, and if we're talking about what psychological things might have been going or were going on with Lynn Vernon, uh, that the DSM could be helpful in that respect. I don't follow that um, line of questioning. Okay. Well, would you, somebody who commits suicide probably has some. Thing going on with their mental health, some problem with their mental health that caused them to want to kill themselves. Sometimes that's true. Not all the time. Okay. And so knowing whether or not a person has a mental health history or mental health issues could be helpful. It would be helpful in making decisions about whether their might, person might be depressed and want to kill themselves. Well, the mental health history is certainly important. Okay. And so what I'm saying to you is it's important to know whether something is a mental health issue, and the DSM 
tells us what things are mental health issues, doesn't it? It's not the only source of information on mental health issues. That is a coding um, directory, essentially, and I don't use that. doesn't mean I don't know anything about mental health issues. Well, okay, let me ask you the question this way. Would you agree that insomnia <coughs> is a disorder? Yes. Okay. And you'd agree that anxiety is a disorder? Yes. And you'd agree that depression is a disorder? Yes. And you'd agree that the agoraphobia is a disorder? Yes. And you'd agree that um, uh, the major depression is a disorder? Yes. And substance abuse, including pills or alcohol, is also a disorder? Yes. We don't need the book because you know it, right? As I said, it's not the only source of information. And then Lynn was seen at Aurora on 5-22-18, looking at page 154 of the record. <clears throat> Would you agree she's there complaining of diarrhea and nausea? Yes. She had been seen by a GI specialist at ProHealth and had multiple evaluations and studies done, apparently there. Yes. Is she supposed to be on a certain diet? Is that fair? It, that's what it says. And in regard to the diarrhea, do you see where it says, in regard to the diarrhea, she thinks it's because she ate food? She did not eat for a long time and irritated her stomach like Chinese food and mashed potato with butter. Do you see that? Yes, I see it now. <clears throat> she would like a refill on her Alprazolam. Yes. She was on pain medications for her back, but she's not taking them anymore. Yes. She's currently stopped. That's what she tells the provider. Yes. We don't know if that's, if she really did stop, but she tells them that she stopped. Right? That's true. Okay. Take that down. Brought your, you brought, somebody brought the pills over. Yes. They're in bags. Yes. They're, they're sealed up? Yes. Is there, um, can we open these? Yes. Oh, who, who should open them? Do you want to open them? It doesn't them? matter to me. You might want to wear gloves, though. Oh, okay. I don't have any gloves. Do you have any gloves with you? <laughs> no, I do bring gloves. Oh, okay. Why, why, why should I wear gloves? Because they were brought from a death scene. I just think it would be... Um, we would usually handle such medications with gloves. Well, all right. I'll use a Kleenex to lift the bags out. I don't have any gloves with me. These have been sitting, though, since October of 2018, right? Not in the same bag, as you know. So here's one bag, right? Yes. I think we'll mark this as an exhibit. We have an exhibit sticker. Um, I'm sorry, I just didn't have any handy. I'm going to, I'm going to have, uh, let me put it on. I don't want you to touch it. I have one more. The bag's probably okay. It's the medication that should be handled. Oh, okay. Yeah. Will we be starting with, do you know what exhibit number we have next? <coughs> I think it's 587. 587 and 588. <coughs> so I'll do 587 and 588 because there's two bags. All right, I'm going to show you what I've marked as exhibits 587 and 588. Do you need to seem close up? No. 
Uh, do you, were these the medications that were found at Lynn Hernan's home? Yes. And gathered by your deputy medical examiner? Yes. And there's many, many pill bottles? Yes. You've kept these all this time? Yes. You didn't dispose of these? No. Move for admission of 587 and 588, Your Honor. No objection. All right, exhibits 587 and 588 are received. Now, I was looking, I want to look and compare to exhibit 530. Can we bring 530 back up again? It was a medication inventory that we talked about this morning. And on here, Madam Clerk, do you have a pair of scissors I could use? I'm not really concerned about these bags that are been sitting for five years. I'm going to open it. Thank you. Any objection from the state to the bags being open? To the bags being open? No. All right, thank you. The exhibit on the screen is already in evidence, State's Exhibit 21. All right, but I want to compare it to what I'm going to find in here. I know it's in evidence. Oh, right. 21's in evidence, actually. Oh, okay. Can we bring it up on your state's oh. Exhibit 21? Yeah, I'll just um, unpublish for a moment and we'll do that. We both marked it in advance. Right, that was the one of the exhibits that Ms. Kukis uh, identified and was offered and received through her. Yes, 20 and 21. Actually, it's 21 and 22 are the inventories. Attorney Kukler, as you take them out of the bag, if you could tell us how many are in each bag for the record, that would be great. A big one. Which yeah. is 587. We've got seven. Hopefully we got that right. Attorney Nikolai, if you want to come up and watch, you can. Just to verify. Five, no, that first bag, I'm sorry, it was 588, Judge. All right, and now I'm seven? looking at 587. Where can we keep them separate? That's what I'm trying to do. Of, okay, so these are for this one? Yes. Okay. And 587 has eighteen items. Are you giving those to the witness to, or well, just? I'm going to in a minute. Okay. So I see on a lot of the prescription bottles, doctor, uh, for example, I'm just picked, picking two, uh, for example, um, one that's called synth Synthoid. Yes. And one's called Triamterine. Yes. And I see the quantity, I just want to show you, do you agree that they, the quantities are circled on it? Yes. Is that something a pharmacy does? I don't know. You don't know who made the circles on the no on the bottles. You didn't do it. No, not me. And isn't it true when a pharmacy? Do you know that uh, when pharmacies prescribe a controlled substance that they circle the quantity on it? No. Okay. And so a lot of these bottles, 
have nothing left in them. That's how you recovered them, is that right? Correct. This baclofen. She even has a note on it, doesn't she? Did Lynn put a note on the bottle of the baclofen? I don't know. Did you ever look at the bottles to see if Lynn put any notes on them? It's been a long time, and they've been sealed. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. It's been a long time, so I don't recall. Do, do you think that you looked at the bottles and studied each one to see if there were notes on them? I know I did when you visited the office. Did you read that Lynn had a note to discontinue? I don't recall. All right. And so when you gathered all, when your medical, deputy medical examiner gathered all these medications from her home, then you put it, did you put it together in this chart? No, Tabitha did. Tabitha made uh, Exhibit 530. Um, or 21. 21. Yes. That's correct. Her signature's on the bottom. Okay. And so uh, did, you com did you compare these to Exhibit 21 to make sure it was accurate? I think we both did. Oh, after the fact? Yes. When we met? Yes. But prior to meeting with you, when you were working on the case, did you, uh, while you were, when you were putting together a report in your autopsy, had you checked those things? Probably not. I want to sh uh, take this down. I'm going to move to a different subject. Can you take that down? Mm -hmm. Could I? Uh, I would like to show you 564. We defense is marked as 564. Okay. Would you show it to the witness first, please? It's not in evidence yet. 564? Yes. All right. Let me know if you can see that in front of you. First of all, can you show uh, Dr. It's on there. Okay. Can you show her the exhibit number? Do you see a 564 on there? Yes. And then can you go up to the top? And um, uh, Is that called suicide ingestion cases? Yes. Between 1-1-2017 one, one, and 2-4-22? Correct. Is this something uh, that, you, that you're familiar with, this document? Yes. Is this a, a chart that your office um, has made? Yes. Move for admission of Exhibit 564. No objection. Exhibit 564 is received. I'd like to publish. Granted. So earlier this morning I talked to you about um, the different ways that you've seen suicides in Waukesha County, and then I, I focused in on the um, area of ingestion inhalation, is that right? Yes. And this is uh, your, your summary or your, uh, I guess, a more detailed description would be a better way of phrasing it, of some of the substances you've seen in those five years that have caused, uh, that people have taken together that's resulted in their death. Yes. And they're these are suicides. Yes where you, you believe that people deliberately took these, this combination of drugs, these drugs, and, with the intent to kill themselves. Yes. And I talked to you this morning about the deadliness of combining opioids and benzos, right? Yes. And you agreed, didn't you, that they are dangerous? Yes. Let's look at this chart. I want to have you identify if you could, you, with, maybe, maybe you could circle it, I think the screen is available to do that, or put a, a check mark to the left of, how about that, of every case where a person died from suicide, committed suicide using benzos and opioids. Just start at the top and put check marks so they together. Could, together. Together, but they're not, not the only things. You mean? Oh, we can. We'll go into them. I just want to. Okay. Yeah. So, well, you're asking me if they're in the list at all to check it. 
if they're in it together. Right. Okay. If there's a benzo and the opioid together. Okay. Check it. Is, uh, is there a way to be red so it'd be easier to read, uh, Judge? You can change the color. Like that. Um, I don't have any idea how to do that. Hold on. Take the uh, publish off for a second. Okay, maybe I can. You should have. Um, see the three bars? I think that's at the very bottom of your screen yeah. in the middle. Just press that for me, please. You can change the color. Okay. What color do you want? You want red, you want purple, you want green. Yeah, red will be fine, just so it's, it, it'll show up a little better. The yellow um, was hard I'm going to have her clear the screen and then restart so it's not duplicate. All right. And then, okay, then get rid of this. I think it'll. Yeah. Oh, yeah, okay. All right, go ahead. You can publish, ma'am. I don't know why it's an arrow and a dot sometimes. <laughs> <laughs> why don't you switch to that writing tool to the left there? Do you see that writing tool on your screen? On the left of the screen, the yeah. blue. Yeah. It's blue. That one? Oh, no, this one. It, it's highlighted. <laughs> Clear the screen again. <laughs> I just think it'll be easier for you. <coughs> so we're going to make this just a little bit bigger. All right, that should. There we go. Okay, like that. Oh, oh, test it again. That wasn't. Can you test it? Oh, so I should try to see if I can do a check? Yes. I see. Okay. Okay, great. Are those both accurate? No. We no. We're right. just testing. We'll clear again. Can oh. I do it on the right rather than the left? You can do it anywhere on <laughs> okay. that screen. Okay, all right. All right, thank you. I should have one of those styles. You're going to have to scroll down. Yeah. It will change. So do you want a capture of this? Yes, please. Madam Clerk, please capture. We'll mark that. You can try this, Doctor. I'm not sure how oh, to test okay. it, but okay. it is one of those pens that oh, might I see. work on the screen. Okay. All right. <laughs> we'll move. So have we captured it? I believe so. Yeah. I'll just hit it again so it's ugly make sure because I didn't look inside. All right, so we'll know. mark a 564A. And then you can clear that, Madam Clerk. Okay, now do it again? Yes. We'll continue with the next as we're moving down. I went. The, I did. I just touched it, and that happened. Oh. The arrow. I just put a check on the top of the arrow. Okay, I think that's everything with an opioid and a benzodiazepine. Oh, there's another page. Oh, there's another page. Yeah, so we'll okay. just capture right. this page. All right, we'll capture that as 564B. Eventually it'll be marked as that, okay? All right. Page two from exhibit 564 is being displayed to the witness now. Oh, you already checked it, huh? Oh, yeah, I know the answer. Can we capture that piece? <laughs> now, I, 
I've counted that that it seems to be that there's ten of them. All right, I wasn't counting, so I'm going to show you the chart and okay. you can take a look at it. And the total number of cases that you have are 42. Okay. That's when I counted your your chart. It looks like 10 out of 42 suicides had a combo of opioids and benzos. There may have been other things in their system too. Okay. But I'm going to give it to you because I'd like you to verify. Would you like a copy? I could give mine up sure and she that. could mark on and then we'll, we could work off that as That's well. Any objection from the state? No. All right. Would you like a highlighter to mark on a paper <laughs> copy at this point? Um, I don't know what I'm going to be asked to mark. But okay. Well, just you could mark on there. Oh, there those go. same cases. Oh, okay. Sometimes old school is a little bit better. Not always. So I do it again, now on paper? Yeah, go ahead. This is a, probably a better way. And then we'll have a good exhibit. You could probably just write D on it if you wanted to, because it has it has your exhibit sticker copied on it. Up to you. I'll make that five sixty four D. I have nine, so I don't know if I missed one, because I wasn't counting what I did it the first time. Sure, may I, put, may I have it and put an exhibit sticker sure. on it? Thank you. Eight, nine. Is it ten? Oh, where's oh, page two? Oh, it's on the back. Oh, sorry. Okay. Yeah, no, there's eleven. There's eleven? Yeah. Okay. And what are the total number of cases that you did I count correct at forty two? Okay, thank you. Um, judge, I move for admission of Exhibit 564D. No objection. 
Exhibit 564D is received. Do you want to use it for a minute, maybe? If you, oh. if you need to, I don't know. I don't know. Okay. Uh, would you agree, then, that of your suicide ingestion cases for that five-year period from 2017 through 2022, it looks like 25% of them, roughly, uh, are a combination of opioid, opioids and benzos or maybe other things with it, or maybe not. Some of them don't have other things with it. That's true. Right? And I will take that exhibit from you. That's that's. That's a lot, a quarter of them. Yes. Madam Clerk, I'm going to have her copy that for me so I have it with my working ones. Thank you. couple points before I move to a, a bigger area. Um, back in 2018 when you were looking at th this case in October and in that time frame, you received a call, did you not, from John Frya? Not me personally. I or, know that he contacted the office. John Frya called the office. Yes. And because you had... Um, mentioned that you kept a telephone log of things yesterday. Is that right? Well, my office does. I'm sorry, then I mean your office. There's a telephone log, yes? Yes. And he called with concer concerns. Objection, hearsay. Sustained. After receiving, do you know who John, John Frye um, used to be a deputy district attorney in Waukesha County, is that true? That's what somebody told me. Didn't you work with him over the years? Uh, you've been the chief of the medical examiner's office. Did you have cases with him over the years? I don't recall. What don't. years was he here? I would have to look. But you knew, anyway, you do know that he was, um, at one point in time, uh, a district attorney here in Waukesha County. I was told that. And he called with... He called the office uh, to give information, is that right? I would have to look. I know we have notes about what his concerns were. And do you recall how that he hadn't seen Lynn himself? Objection, hearsay. Sustained. Was there any information in uh, that you received that you thought was significant about uh, Lynn's, Lynn's behavior? Objection calls for hearsay. Sustained as to the form of the question. Do you, when you're considering all the information that you said that you have to take into consideration in uh, making a determination in a, in, in a, a case like this, um, you said you consider everything. Yes, everything I have available. Is the deceased behavior an important factor for you to consider? Her be, the deceased behavior in the time be preceding death important? Yes. And so if you received uh, information, you would have taken that into consideration? Yes. Do you receive any information, uh, without saying what information you might have received, because I don't want you to testify to hearsay, but did you receive what would be important information from John Fryan? that you thought was important? I don't recall information from John Frya, although I know there are records in my file about um, his conversations with my staff. Judge, I'd like a 
brief sidebar if I could. Okay. The objection is sustained. Well, actually, I don't know if there was an objection. There was a sidebar regarding the topic, so there's nothing to sustain. <laughs> Go ahead, Attorney Kukler. All right, I'm going to show this witness um, what's marked. Witness as, only. Hold on. Just witness. Yeah, take it off the. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, we haven't brought it up yet. Right. Yes. Uh, what's marked as exhibit 525. Can you see that on your screen? Yes. Is this a, a, a note from your office, Tabitha Cooks? Yes. Dated October, well, it's October 15, 2018. Is that right? Yes. All right. If you just look at that, to read that to yourself. Okay. Is this Exhibit 525 part of your record? Yes. You recognize this document? Yes. It's, it's, it's a medical examiner document, is that Correct. true? Mm -hmm. So have you seen this before today? Yes. Is this something that you considered, the information in this report, something that you considered in forming an expert opinion in this case? I considered it. Then I move for admission of 525. Objection uh, sustained. Uh, some more foundation is needed uh, before I receive the exhibit. So you considered a phone call that was received uh, on October 15, 2018, is that right? Yes. What in this exhibit did you uh, consider to be important that you, you, what information in this exhibit did you use to reach your expert that you considered relevant in forming an expert opinion? I'm going to object this question calls for hearsay again. Sustained as to the form of the question that mischaracterizes her testimony. Did you use, you, did I understand you correctly that you considered and, util and um, utilized information in 525 in forming an expert opinion in this case? It's one of the many things you, you, you utilized. I consider everything. So I considered this, whether it really placed as a piece of the foundation for my opinion regarding cause of death is another matter. Well, did it? 
it had no information that affected my opinion regarding cause of death. Okay. Or manner of death? Correct. So is the information that was provided about, um, have you read this entire document to yourself since we Yes. Mm -hmm. And there's nothing in here that you can uh, use to uh, form an opinion in this case? Correct. But it's fair to say that you were only able to determine that it wasn't a basis after you evaluated the information. Correct. You evaluated it. Yes. Judge, I, I think that's sufficient to, to admit 525. It's something that she evaluated. Two layers of hearsay. Um, the objection is sustained. Yesterday you talked about and actually summarized some studies, right? Yes. Put it together a chart? Yes. You introduced it as Exhibit 211? I can't remember the number. I'll show you. Okay. That would be easier. Do you see that? Yes. Um, to exhibit 211? Yes. Am I right? Is that the uh, paper you put together that summarized the articles that you read? Yes. Now, at the time that you performed the autopsy in this case, that was within, uh, that was on October 4th of 2018, right? Yes. And you've been and, and you issued your final determination, or when did you issue your final determination? Is that the September 27th, 2019 letter from your office? Um, I, well, there was a letter. I don't remember how it was phrased. In other words, I don't know if the letter was written on, December, on September 27th or the death certificate was signed on September 27th. Well, when did you... When, when did you reach your decision? What day? On the day I signed the death certificate. When was that? Well, that's what I can't tell you because I don't know what, don't recall what that letter says. Oh, could I show you? Uh, sure. The letter. May I approach a witness to show her the letter, Judge? Sure. Sorry. What is oh. it? Evidence 36. Can you see that letter? Yes. All right. So is I'm just trying to determine when you reached your conclusion on what the cause and manner of death was for Lynn Hernan. Can you tell us what the date was? Um, I don't know if the date that I signed the death certificate was September 27th or not. I mean, it, the letter is dated September 27th, but I don't see in the letter the date that um, indicates what date I signed the death certificate. All right. Well, that's the letter you wanted to see, isn't that right? Yes. So I can't answer the question about the date of the death certificate. I only can say that that's the date the letter was written. Was was it in September of 2019 that you reached your decision? Can we pin it down to a month or a year? It's probably around then. Because when we read your autopsy protocol, the only date on it uh, is, is having to do with October 4, 2018. Correct. You didn't put a date by your signature. No. We don't know when you actually prepared this report or signed it, right? Well, the, a lot of the report was prepared the day I did the autopsy. It doesn't get completed until I can put cause of death on the front page.
And that's what I'm trying to determine. When did you do that? Well, the death certificate would be signed first, then the autopsy report would be completed. And this letter that you, that you drafted is indicating that a death certificate has been signed and filed with the register, uh, Waukesha County Register of Deeds and the vital records. That letter is dated September 27, 2019, right? Correct. So do you, do you think that that's about the time that you did that? Yes. Okay. So it took you a, almost a year? Yes. Before you, you made a decision? Yes. And you said pre at, at, at prior occasions that we've talked to you that you considered, and in court, that you considered uh, other resources in reaching a conclusion that there was tetrahydrazoline poisoning here. You, you conducted research. You've read papers. Is that right? That's a lot of questions. Yes, I conducted research. Yes, I did read papers. All right. Because prior to this death, you had never uh, called a death from tetrahydrazoline poisoning, had you? No, I had not. You don't have any experience with it? No, my first case. You don't know what to look for on a, per a person's body if there's any signs that you should look for, right? You're not trained in it. Not trained in looking at a person's body or not trained in tetrahydrazoline poisoning? Tetrahydrazoline poisoning. No, I had no training in that specific poisoning. <coughs> and you've brought a bunch of literature, you've given us a bunch of literature and you summarized it in that exhibit. That You can take that exhibit down. Um, a lot of the information that you put in this exhibit to Yalaba has to do with literature, pieces of paper that aren't even peer reviewed. Isn't that true? Not a lot. The last four are the only ones that are not peer reviewed. And is it your, are these the articles, are these the articles that you reviewed uh, well, you, to help you form <clears throat> your opinion, you can take. I, does she see anything on her? I don't want the witness to see anything right now. Okay. Well, I was going to look at the years of publication because there's a lot of most of the literature is pre 2018. So I did consider those at the time I signed this case out. But I know some of the media reports and maybe an additional piece of literature might be post 2018. But I still included this because it's information that we have today. Well, I, what I'd like to know is of the articles that you mentioned in here, which ones did you read back uh, at the time that you formed your opinion in this case? Which of these articles had you read? The ones that are pre-2018. Okay, including articles by Henry Spiller. Yes. Our expert that we're going to be bringing in. Yes. Have you reviewed Henry Spiller's um, report? Yes. And did you review our pathologist report? Yes. Have you called either one of them to talk about the case and their opinions? No. <clears throat> now these various studies that you were talking about or reports that you were talking about yesterday, you'd agree that as you sit here, <laughs> you have no idea about these people's medical history, except if there was a little mention in the article. What I know about the medical history of the people in the papers was what was in the papers. They're not personal patients of mine. Well, right. So in other words, you didn't look at their medical records. You don't know if they had some kind of pre-existing condition or otherwise. You, you have no idea. As I said, that's a very broad statement. The papers may have discussed the particulars of each individual. For example, one of the suicide cases I recall specifically had emphysema. So there are there is medical history according, associated with some cases, but you know that's what I can tell, tell you. You didn't delve into these in particular. You didn't go and try to, besides reading the article, get some actual records from the case and look, and look into it in any respect. The cases are anonymous. It would not be possible for me to do that. And you 
uh, would agree that the people in these cases went to hospitals. Yes. And you talked yesterday about how hospitals aren't equipped to do the testing, this, the, the, the sophisticated testing that NMS labs can do. Is that right? That's true. And so these people all were all tested at these hospitals with this less sophisticated testing system, right? But no, I definitely couldn't say that. I mean, if they had results for tetrahydrazoline, it doesn't say that this was done in the hospital lab or it was sent out to a specialty lab. There's no information about it. Well, all these people were in the hospital. You'd agree with that? Yes. And you talked yesterday about uh, people being in the ICU. Do you remember talking about that? Yes. But if somebody comes into a hospital with poisoning, any kind of poisoning, they're going to be in the ICU, aren't they? I would not agree with that. You're going to put them on the general floor? It certainly depends on the agent, the clinical picture, and the assessment of the physician seeing them. So you believe that people coming into a hospital with poisoning would just be put on the general floor rather than seen in an ICU? It's up to the clinical judgment of the treating physician. Well, the first uh, report that you mentioned is about uh, is a person uh, for a tetrahydrazoline for what is called uh, a submission, right? Some kind of a, an assault of some sort, is that right? A 16-year-old? You know, I don't have this in front of me, so I don't know what, you know, particular, I can't we'll agree it's the first again. case or whatever. All right, we'll bring up 211 on your screen so you can see it. We don't need the jury to see it. That might help you. I've turned on the monitor. Let's just take a moment. Attorney Kukler, I don't know how much you have left, but I do want to give the jury a break this afternoon. We've well, why don't we do it now before I start going into all the literature? Okay, that's great. All right. Uh, I'll take about 20 minutes. I'll rise for the jury, please. The first concerned exhibit, 541, uh, that record or that exhibit is the roughly 326 pages from ProHealthCare, I believe. It's either ProHealthCare or Aurora. I'll double check that. Uh, but in any event, there was uh, a section of one of those records specifically that the state objected to. Uh, because there, it appeared to be, and I confirm this, that the statements were attributed, attributed to Ms. Kershevsky and not the victim, Lynn Hernan, so that would be really double hearsay. Um, also, Attorney Kukler was the one going through that, and even though the record has been received by the court, doesn't always mean it's all of it either is goes to the jury or can be addressed in front of the jury, and certainly that would be double hearsay. That would be uh, one of the reasons not to, and uh, the case law is pretty clear that can't the, the defendant's own attorney cannot offer what would otherwise be hearsay statements of the client because there's not the exception like the state has being a party opponent, um, unless it was being offered for some other purpose that really wasn't what it was being offered for. Uh, so I came back, I sustained the objection, and actually Attorney Kukler made some further, had some further questions that I think clarified uh, what um, the doctor was looking at and 
uh, who the statements were attributed to. So that, I think, was cleared up. Then the second sidebar had to do with Exhibit 525. I did not receive it at the time of the objection. Uh, the state uh, had objected based upon double hearsay. At sidebar, I thought there was not really a foundation that this witness as an expert had relied upon that um, what is contained in that exhibit, and that was the note, it was a supplemental investigative report from Tabitha Kukas um, regarding the phone call that she had with John Fryett. Um, and so I indicated I did not think there was a foundation um, I was concerned about the double hearsay um, and that if it were to be established uh, that Dr. Bids Ricky, uh, sorry, Ritsky, um, had utilized that in any way in forming her opinion as an expert, that would be a different story. She indicated through her testimony subsequent to that that um, while she considered it, it did not weigh in in any way to her opinions on cause and manner of death and was based upon that that I ultimately did not receive Exhibit 525. Um, anything either party wants to put on the record regarding those two sidebars from the state? Judge, I think, I thought Exhibit 525 was actually entered through Ms. Kukas, I understand the court saying that you didn't allow it to be published today, but I thought I thought that that investigative report has actually been received into evidence. Let me look at my notes. You're right; it was received uh, through Ms. Kukas as a report regarding a phone call that she had. But regardless, I don't believe it was ever published, and certainly. Uh, for the reason it was being sought to be published today, uh, I did not think was proper. So um, that's why I did not allow it to be published. So I, I misspoke a little bit. You're right, it was received. But again, just because something's received doesn't mean it comes in and it, or it's published to the jury. Um, all right, so thank you for that. But anything else regarding those two sidebars, do you believe I otherwise accurately portrayed our discussion? Yes, I do. All right, Attorney Kukler, anything as it relates to those two sidebars? No. Uh, you would agree with what Attorney um, Nikolai just pointed out, and that is 525 was received through Tabitha Kukas, but um, again, it was really whether it be published. It was received through her. All right. Then uh, we'll all take our break. Please be back here in... Um, 15 minutes. I do have a request that we pack this back up and put it back in the paper bag so that it's not just laid out on this table because I believe the defense is done with it. Um, that would be appropriate unless there's going to be questioning. I thought at one point you were going to ask Dr. B to confirm, but that never happened. So um, will they fit back in now that they've been cut or do we need to put them back in the paper bag? I think they'll fit back in there and all right, I know we need to make sure that they are maintained, they're separate exhibits, so we should do that during the break. All right, other than that, we're in recess. Thank you.
All right, if we're ready to go, we'll have the jury brought out. Madam Clerk. Thank you, everyone. Please be seated. You may continue, Attorney Kugler. I wanted to review some of the articles for, uh, that you oh. referred to yesterday in it, your Exhibit 211. For example, you, you brought an article about a U.S.-France collaboration to document, um, remember that article? Yes. And that's about Visine, is that right? Yes. And this was about a discussion of putting, that, that, this, that this child he had, uh, who was living in France with his mother, right? Yes. Like you mentioned. And he had been given by somebody, supposedly some tetrahydrosoline. Yes. And in that article, is it true that they referred to a dis and the child is fine, right? Fair to say that this child didn't die. No. In fact, these kids all lived in these articles. Yes. Every one of the people, every one of these children, a lot of these articles are about children, and every one of those children lived. Yes. None of them died from tetrahydrosoline. Correct. But in this particular article and study, isn't it true that they, there's a discussion about administering two drops directly into the Con uh, conjectable sac of each eye. Remember reading that? No. May I look at it? Sure. It, because some, it, they did a test on adult patients by putting by putting uh, visine in the sac of their eye, and then tested their blood to see if their blood shows tetrahydrosoline if they used it in their eye. Do you remember reading that? Oh yes, that's the CAR article. Well, it's also in this article that you've referred to on this U.S.-France collaboration. It referred to the CAR article. So you'd agree then that a person can get tetrahydrosoline in their blood by using it in their, by using tetrahydrosoline in their eyes. Yes. And depending on how much tetrahydrosoline a person uses in their eyes, would determine the level of concentration in the blood. Yes. And when 
in that study, they used 10 adult patients, isn't that right? As you, rec you recall that? I don't know the number, I don't remember the number of uh, patients. And they checked them 24 hours after, they checked them at different points after administration of the drops, right? Yes. Including at 24 hours. I can't confirm that without looking at the article. Which article would you want to, well, I'll show you this article. Okay. Can we bring up this article? Saved all of them on my uh, on my uh, server, but uh, I'm going to just mark this and let you look at it. I do it in an old-fashioned way. You have exhibit stickers, yeah? They're in my folder. What number am I on? Attorney Nikolai takes a peek at it. Five eighty nine. Dan approached Judge. You may. Just first want to ask you if that's the article you were talking about yesterday. Yes. On page two I did some highlighting. Okay. Okay. Yeah, it says, yeah, it's, well, I mean, I don't know if I can answer all your questions from memory, but it says 10 adult patients. Okay. Yeah. And did they test the adult patients at, at 24 hours? Yes. And what were the ranges of uh, THC levels at, at, at that point? I think they gave a range. Yes, 13 to 210 nanograms per mil. At 24 hours? Yes. So at the high end, 210? Correct. And what was Lynn's tetrahydrazoline level? We had no urine to test. Okay, so the levels uh, would be different in urine versus blood? Oh, yes. Okay. But in Lynn's blood, it was 160, wasn't it? Yes. You brought in a, it looked like a newspaper article about a case in Aurora, Colorado. Yes. You familiar, you're familiar with that case? Only what it says in the newspaper article. Well, you brought it in and you put it on your chart. Yes. You thought it was relevant information. Yes. Did you work on this case? No. Do you, would, do you know that this is a case where uh, an Aurora dentist uh, tried to poison his wife with large quantities of tetrahydrazoline. That was the allegation. And it didn't kill her. Did you know that? Did you know he snuck back into the hospital and gave her cyanide to kill her? Because the tetrahydrazoline, despite the doses after doses after doses that he was giving her, didn't do it. Did you know that? I would say that he added cyanide. I'm not saying that tetrahydrazoline was not effective. But you don't really have any, you didn't work on this case. No. Somebody who worked on this case might be in a better position to tell us more information. That's true. She ultimately died of cyanide poisoning in that case, didn't she? 
I don't know what the conclusion was in terms of what was on the death certificate. And when you presented uh, information from an article from Lowry, L-O-W-R-Y, on serum concentrations in three children with unintentional tetrahydrazoline overdose. Do you remember that article? Yes. Uh, you, you're not comparing children with adults, are you? I'm comparing blood levels that caused, um, I'm giving examples of the blood levels and urine levels that are available. And many, some were in children and some were adults. Well, in this article that you provided information about yesterday, again, this involves three cases, three children. Yes. None died. Right. Again, no, they didn't die from tetrahydrosoline. No. Nope. In this case, uh, these three cases, though, they did check their THC concentrations 7 and 12 hours after ingestion. THC is not right. Or TH, they, they, say, they say THC. They do, okay. Um, but they mean tetrahydrosoline. Is that what they mean? Well, it's about tetrahydrosoline, not tetrahydrocannabinol. Right. Okay. Isn't that THC? Yeah. Tetrahydro. Uh, isn't that what you said? No, THZ. Z, I'm sorry. Um, they, they tested their THZ Z, uh, levels at uh, 7 and 12 hours after ingestion. Okay. Is that right? I, can't, I don't remember the, all these details. Well, you, yesterday you, 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 you were talking about levels that were I, tested. Yes, but I had a chart in front of me. That's why I made the chart, because I can't remember all those details. Well, that's fair. Then we're going to just bring up chart uh, exhibit 211 again, to be fair, so you can look at it. And that would be page two, I think, on her chart. This is the, which article? This is, uh, would be, uh, this would be talking about 9, 10, and 11 on her chart, the Lowry 2011 article, L-O-W-R-Y. You, 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 uh, do you see it in front of you? No. Oh, could we share it with the screen, with the witness? Okay. Thank you. Uh, the issue is... Depending on the font size, Exhibit 211 that I have is a three-page exhibit, and it it's they're the same content-wise. It's just the font and the number of rows are different. Okay. I found it. It's on uh, on this different size exhibit. It's on uh, two, on the 211 that's in the record. It's on page one. Do you have that in front of you? Yes. It's the Lowry. 2011, do you, is that visible for you? Yes, except there's a sticker over the last column. Oh, this is not the version of the record. I just want to talk to you about the Lowry article. You're looking at one form or another of Exhibit 211. Is, yeah. it, is the Lowry article referenced in here so that I could ask you a few questions? Yes, I only am saying that the exhibit sticker is over the last case, so I don't know if that's also the Lowry case. Would you like a paper copy of 211? Sure. Okay, great. May I? Go ahead. Thank you. You bet. Okay. Is that easier? It is. Okay. So again, talking about this Lowry article, there were three children. Yes. Three case studies involving children. Am I right? Yes. And none of them died. Correct. Because in fact, in all these things you presented, none of these kids died in any true. of these articles. Right? That's true. Okay. And they did, in fact, <clears throat> case one, test the... 
THZ levels uh, at 7 and 12 hours after ingestion, right? Yes. And in case two, they tested it two hours post ingestion, right? Yes. And in case three, uh, three hours post ingestion. Yes. Case three, no urine concentrations were obtained, just um, just blood, plasma. When they say plasma, that means blood. Is that right? Um, a portion of the blood, yes. Okay. Now, you don't know, you, strike that, is it your position that adults and children uh, su suffer the same, uh, it's a, a drug is as fatal in the same doses with a child and an adult? May not be, depends on the individual. And it'd be fair to say that a two-year-old child, for example, just as an example, uh, who would be given a smaller amount of a, a, of a dangerous drug could die from it, whereas somebody who was older and bigger, it might, it might cause some symptoms, but they might not die. That would be true. And so when you're looking at these children, you can't, there's not research out there that compares children's THC and somehow can relate that to an adult, is there? I haven't seen it. No. So you just thought this was interesting? It's the information that's available. Nobody's doing studies dosing people with tetrahydrazoline and measuring their blood. All we have are case reports. What about uh, the seventh article that you have mentioned on your list? It's an it's a article by Suad El Abri. Yes. A L hyphen A B R I for the record. Yes. I've got a copy of that article from the Journal of Medical Toxicology. This was an 18 month old child brought to the emergency department, right? Yes. And this particular child had ingested milk, I think you said yesterday, um, that had been, had some tetrahydra. Drazoline uh, in it, THC. Yes. It had been meant for another family member. Is that what I remember you saying? Yes. And they tested the child's urine and their serum, and um, the serum had 21.56 NG per ml. Is that right? Yes. And we don't know when the child <coughs> specifically ingested it. Is that right? That's right. And we don't know even to this day what the half-life is of THC. There are estimates, but no studies. And that, uh, and so without knowing what the half-life is of a drug and when a person took a drug, it's kind of hard to say when you see a certain level how much they took or when they took it. And you would, yes, that's true. Dose would be important as well. Is there any bioaccumulation of THC? I can't answer that question because it also requires a bioaccumulation over what period of time, but I don't know. What does it mean for the jury, a bioaccumulation? Can you explain that term? Mm, do you store it? I mean, do you, you know, if you drink, if you use a drug, is it like put away and become released at a later date? And that could be true in a very short term or true in a long term. But we don't know. I don't know. I don't know. I noticed that one of the articles you referred to was 
uh, written by Henry Spiller, and he's written about tetrahydrazoline, is that right? Yes. And you read some of his literature back in 2018 when you formed an, uh, an opinion in this case? Yes. You considered the things that he wrote about it? Yes. You consider him an expert in the field? In the expert of what field? In the field of toxicology. I don't think so. Do you know him? Do you know his qualifications? I read his CV. I don't know him personally. All of these patients in these, these articles that you provided information about were discharged to home. From the medical articles, that's true. I'm talking about the medical articles. That's true. Do you think that um, rapid weight fluctuations can cause a release of bioaccumulated substances? I don't know. It might depend on the substance. Have you ever thought about it? No. How many milliliters of tetrahydrazoline did we figure out was in a bo bottle? 15? Yes. Okay. And then the article that you talked about involving uh, Lev, L-E-V, written by Dr. Lev. You familiar with that one? It's on your list? Yes. Lev, 1994? Yes. That person... Uh, was an adult, a 41-year-old man, who had attempted suicide uh, by drinking 30 milliliters of tetrahydrazoline. Is that right? Yes. Because his friends told him that you could commit suicide with it. Is that what it says in the article? I don't recall that part. I'll show you. I'd like to show where the article Go ahead. That's true. His friends told him that Visine ingestion was a quick method for suicide. Six, right? Yes. He didn't die. He didn't die. Right. He was uh, awake and asymptomatic by hospital day two. Is that true? Yes. After drinking two bottles. Two, two whole bottles, right? Yes. But apparently somebody did try to kill themselves by drinking tetrahydrazoline themselves. Yes. And you provided information on a, also a 76-year-old man who drank uh, Visine eye drops voluntarily because he was suicidal also. Is that right? Yes. And isn't it true in the article you pre, uh, provided by Mary Carr, C-A-R-R. Do you remember that article? Yes. In that article, isn't it true that uh, they indicate that when used as directed by the manufacturer for therapeutic ocular administration, we found tetrahydrazoline concentrations to be detectable in both serum and urine up to 12 hours after the last dose? Yes. And you know that Lynn Hernan used eye drops. You know it from her medical records. They did not contain tetrahydrazoline. Well, you don't know what all eye drops she had over time. You, you just assume because you saw a reference to one Walgreens? No. In um, all of her medication lists for all her health care providers, lubricating eye drops were listed as something that she used. Lubricating eye drops. 
you don't know what eye drops personally, you don't personally have any personal knowledge of what eye drops Lynn Hernan used. No. We only have blood results. Why was the sample not taken of the vitreous? A sample was taken of the vitreous. Is that in the NMS report? No, no. You asked about if a sample was taken, not if a sample was tested. I oh, didn't, I... yeah, I didn't test the vitreous. I see. Yeah. You took it, but you didn't to send it for testing. Correct. You could have sent it for testing. I could have. You took the sample, that's why you took a sample, so that you could test it. Yes. Take that down. Can we bring up State's exhibit? No. I'm going to bring up your autopsy protocol. Just going to find it in the exhibits. We also had it listed. Exhibit 34. I want to talk to you about that. Do you see it in front of you? Yes. Can I show it? Can I publish it? Go ahead. Um, show up on the jury screen. All right. The uh, first thing that struck me on this protocol at the top is that you amended it on February 2nd, 2023. Yes. You added two sections on page five. Yes. Is that right? And this is, um, well, that's this year. Yes. And I looked at page five. Can we show page five of this report? And you added uh, two sections. page six of the actual exhibit. There we go. Amended section added for the, uh, what is it, geno, gen urinary? How do you say that? Genital urinary. And what do you say, the lymphal reticular? reticular? Yes. <coughs> so in your original autopsy that was done, you didn't put anything in, in, the, in, in the, your autopsy report about her spleen, or her lymph nodes, or kidneys, the bladder. You just didn't, you didn't even talk about it. I missed those sections in my gross exam. I did talk about the kidneys under microscopic. How, how do you forget to list two whole sections in the report? Because I signed it prematurely. I didn't proofread it well. As to the fingernails that Lynn had, those were extensions that she was wearing on her fingernails, isn't it? I don't remember. Is it in my report? Yes. Okay. Because you, you said that you talked about her fingernails yesterday, but they were, they were actually extensions on her nails. That's what you put in your report. Is that, is that right? Uh, if, yes, if it's in the report, that's what they were. I don't independently recall. Okay. And you note in your findings on uh, what will be page two, multiple medication use. Is that yes. right? And you list all the alprazolam and the di dihydrocodone and the hydrocodone and the cyclobenzaprine and the baclofen and the rope and neroli, pill stomach and colon. I don't see anything in here on the, what were the pills that you said you determined were in her, in her abdomen? 
The ones that were undissolved in, in, her, in her stomach? In her stomach? I'm sorry, in her stomach. They look like nifedipine. And you don't mention nifedipine in here? No. Okay. And you saved, uh, I'm sorry, when you, you never tested the pills that were in her, her, her stomach or in her colon. Right. So you don't know what they are or how they might have, um, how it might play into this. I don't understand the last part of your question, how it might play well, into this. We don't know what the results were. The results of a test? Right. Because you didn't test them. Correct. <clears throat> and you felt that the death scene was significant because of the sprinkled drugs, but we've shown you today that those very well could have fallen off of that plate or off of the spoon that you saw on the floor at the scene or even when the body is manipulated. Object to compound question. Sustained us to the form of the question. We showed you, didn't we? You, well, yesterday, I believe I heard you say that you found the uh, death scene to be significant. Yes. All right. And that's because you thought there, there was pills sprinkled on her. That was one feature. But you'd agree with me that today, we showed you if some, and talked to you about if somebody crushed their medication and they picked it up with their hands or with a spoon off of that plate that we've shown you, that that's invariably, some of that's going to spill. Hypothetically, if somebody crushed pills and put it in a spoon, it could spill. Well, even that plate, you saw them, that orange plate, didn't you? Full yes. of crushed medication. Yes. And so either a person, if you're going to take it, is either going to be probably with your fingers or with a spoon, or maybe you could put your head down on it, I guess, right? Those would be the ways you could ingest it? That's true. And if you were going to pick up that loose powder with your fingers and put it in your mouth, some of that powder is going to smell. It could. Probably would, right? I can only say it could. <clears throat> but you concluded that despite all of Lynn's history of drug, drug use being uh, taken off of of various medications being released from um, a patient, be, being released as a patient from one doctor, asking for refill after refill, saving her prescriptions even when she's told to discontinue them. And with all of these prescriptions in her, in her, in her blood, and in everything else that you had tested here, you don't believe that that those combination of drugs would have killed her? What would be called a polydrug overdose? The tetrahydrazoline level and the effects of tetrahydrazoline really um, is more significant than the drug levels that I found in her blood. Even despite your own chart that you prepared in your office of showing all the people who have died from suicide using a combination of of, of benzos and opioids. Well, we don't have information on those levels in that chart at all. Yeah, but you know that they died from it because you put it in the chart. You thought it was significant. Well, that's true. They, okay. Those individuals did die from that. And, and Lynn also had benzos and <coughs> opioids in her. Yes. When she died. Yes. Thank you. That's all. All right, thank you. Attorney Nicolay, uh, go ahead, redirect. <clears throat> you. My jurors want to stand real quick. I know we've been at it, but I'd like to try to get this witness done. You too.
You have everything else? Yeah. Oh, good. All right, thank you. Please have a seat. Dr. Bedrisky, you've been on the stand all day today answering questions for the defense, right? Yes. And you've been shown a lot of real specific pieces of the different components that you reviewed in this case, right? Yes. The first thing I'd like to ask you, is anything that you were shown today causing you to second guess the opinions that you made in this case? No. Are you sure about that? Yes. Okay. Now, I, I don't want to go on very long, but I do just want to clear a few things up with you. I'd like to start with some of the questions that you were asked about the scene, and you indicated that you looked at a lot of the photographs from the scene, including Defense Exhibit 543, page 2, and I'd like to display that and publish it to the jury, please. And this seems like long ago now that you were shown this photo, but I'd like to please display it for everyone. And you were then, you were asked some questions about the table to the decedent's left. Do you remember those? Yes. And if we move to page eight of the same exhibit, <coughs> you were asked quite a few questions about this photograph as well, weren't you? Yes. And about a bottle that's sitting on that table, weren't you? Yes. And ultimately you were shown what's been marked as defense exhibit 584, weren't you? Oh, yes. And there's a sticker on the bottom? Yes. For the jury? Was this collected from that table? No. Okay. So this was just shown to you by the defense appearing similar, perhaps? Yes. Okay, I'm going to leave that there. And I would like you to pick up Exhibit 584 and turn it around and look at the active ingredients and tell me whether there's tetrahydrazoline in that. The active ingredient is listed as 0.25% sodium carboxymethyl cellulose. And it has some inactive ingredients and there's no tetrahydrazoline. Okay. So way back yesterday when I asked you if there was tetrahydrazoline on the scene and you said no, do you believe that's correct? Yes. Even if we assume that that is the same bottle from this photograph, would you still agree there's no tetrahydrazoline on the scene? Yes, I agree okay. with that. <clears throat> Thank you. We can put that exhibit down. The series of questions that you were asked um, all day today really revolved around this idea of suicide. Would you agree with me? It seemed to be trending that way. Okay. Have you signed death certificates before ruling it a suicide? Yes. Okay. Did you do that in this case? No. Why not? I didn't see evidence to support that conclusion. But you've certainly used suicide as a manner before. Yes. And in all of the reviews of death scenes that you've seen, um, did those scenes include suicides? Yes. Okay. If we go back to Exhibit 8, sorry, Exhibit 543, page 8, you were asked a lot of questions about how gravity might affect movement of fragments, is how I'm going to characterize it, right? Yes. Okay. And you'd agree with me that gravity exists and can cause things to move? Yes. All right. So, looking at Exhibit 2, I'm sorry, page 2 of this exhibit, I'm sorry. Okay. <clears throat> 
and specifically as you looked closer at the way this powder was resting on the decedent, was that consistent with all of your experience at death scenes that ultimately were suicides? No. Did this stand out to you? Yes. Why? With ingestions, there is usually the um, substance or product there. I mean, not 100% of the time, but we saw a lot of her pills, but no tetrahydrazoline. Um, two, the um, powders or, or whatever people ingest can sometimes discolor their lips or come bubbling out of their mouth because they're either it's regurgitated or they became unconscious while consuming it. But this is like powder that's not been in contact with her mouth. I mean, it's not vomited up and it's not spit out. It's just laying on her chest. Did the aspect of the powder at the scene influence your decision making in terms of manner of death? Well, I also want to say all the there's a bunch of stuff on the floor on the floor too, so it's sprinkled around. It's a lot of loose powder. Um, it did play a role, not not the only role. Sure. Yes. And again, you found that to be atypical. Yes. <clears throat> Is that why you collected some of the powder and had it tested in this case? Yes, I actually, yeah, it's not something as common that I do. Okay. Do you, do you remember ever doing that before? Not collecting powder distributed in this way. I certainly have collected evidence from bodies, but nothing that really is similar to this. You were asked a lot of questions about how I think suggesting and attempting to get you to agree that this occurred from it falling out of a spoon. Do you remember those questions? Yes. Is that what you think happened? No. What do you think happened? I think that they may have been deposited there. By the decedent? I don't think so. I don't know. I'm going to just speculation. Um, overruled. She answered it and her answer may stand. So, and one of the reasons, and you can take that down, thank you. One of the reasons that this jury certainly knows that you have used suicide as a manner of death before is some of those charts that the defense went through that actually has data from your office in it, right? Right. And are those things that your office created? Uh, why did you make those charts about suicide? Um, two pages are from our annual report that you saw the general statistics and it had annual report on it. The other chart that had that I did all the marks on about the opioids, um, I was asked to create by defense. Could you say that again? I was asked to um, create or provide information about all the uh, multiple drug ingestions that, I that our office classified by suicide by the defense. And then you compiled that information? Yes. Did that take you a significant period of time to do that? Oh, I personally didn't do it. I asked someone in my office to do that. I think that that's a good segue into this discussion or suggestion that I, I made these exhibits with you that the jury has seen yesterday. Do you remember those questions? Yes. Did I ask you and tell you what to put in any exhibit that the jury has seen today? No. Okay. You were asked a lot of questions about where your office is in relation to this courtroom, right? Yes. And I think the term used was that you work hand in hand with law enforcement. Do you remember that? Yes. In reality, in this case, would you consider that you were accommodating to various requests made by Attorney Galavis and Attorney Kukler? Yes. For example, if they wanted to meet with you to talk about the case, did you do that? I did. On multiple occasions? I did. You referenced during cross-examination that Ms. Kukler has seen all of these before. Yes. Could you explain that to the jury? Sorry, just for the record, what? because I could not see. Sorry, these are exhibits 587 and 588. The physical medication. Thank you. 
Yes, I was asked for a meeting um, so that um, defense counsel could examine uh, what we collected and, uh, in fact, open and count all the medication uh, personally. Did that meeting happen? Yes. Was Attorney Coopler there? Yes. Did you go through each medication one by one? Yes. In fact, on that same day, did you have the chart that Ms. Kukas put together regarding things found on the scene? Yes, we looked at the chart and looked at what was in the bags. Did it match? Yes. Okay. When the defense asked your office for documents, did you gather those and, and send those over? I don't recall which documents. I mean, if they asked for documents they could have, I sent them over. Okay. So, and I'd like to reference, just to the witness please, exhibit have the witness look at defense exhibit 563 that's that suicide data that attorney Coopler asked you questions about do you remember that yeah can you let me know when that's on the screen in front of you okay do you remember being asked questions about the age ranges yes. on this exhibit? Yes. And whether Ms. Hernan fit in to the age ranges that are listed on this exhibit? Yes. Is there also a differentiation in this exhibit by gender? Yes. In the year 2020, what was the male versus female suicide rate in Waukesha County? Well, there were 43 men and eight women who committed suicide. Is that type of ratio pretty consistent back through the years according to, to Exhibit 563? It's usually, um, the history shows um, more men more than twice. I mean, maybe three or four times more men than women committing, committing suicide in Waukesha County. Okay. In terms of the pills you were asked about in a very graphic exhibit shown by the defense this morning about um, pills that you located in the stomach and in the colon, do you remember those questions? Yes. <clears throat> Did you, you indicated that you didn't have those tested, right? Right. Would having the results of those tests have any bearing on your cause of death determination? No. Can you please explain that to the jury? If the pills are in the stomach, they're not in the blood. My cause of death is based on what was circulating in her blood at the time. And if we could please put State's Exhibit 35 up, I think it's important for the jury to understand the difference because you had three different types of samples tested for toxicology in Ms. Hernan's case, right? Yes. And what, for example, would be the difference between an iliac blood sample and a gastric fluid sample? Well, iliac blood sample, the blood circulating. So if a, um, a medication is going to have effect on any organ in your body, whether it's the heart or the brain, um, it's the blood that takes it there. If it's in the stomach, the stomach is a sequestered space. It's not yet absorbed into your system. So it's you might consider it what is yet to be absorbed. Okay. You were asked multiple times whether you threw those pills away. Do you remember that? Yes. Could you tell the jury about your retention policy, please? Yes. Any biologic specimens that are refrigerated are discarded 
after one year. Part of that is a space issue, and part of that is a uh, decomposition issue. Biologic specimens, even um, under refrigeration, decompose bacterial contamination. We also save some biologic specimens frozen, serum and liver typically, and those are saved for five years. Formalin fixed tissues are saved for five years. Doctor, you were also asked some questions about an email that you provided to the defense after they asked you for records from your office. Do you remember that? Yes. And you were asked questions about that, but you actually weren't ever able to look at it. Is that true? True. Okay, so for the witness, I'd like to show Defense Exhibit 529. And during cross-examination, you testified that you did believe that there was one email that was turned over... Um, and that was what was in your case file for this case. Is that correct? Yes. Okay. Is this exhibit before you, 529, a copy of that email? Yes. Who is it from? Aaron Hoppy. Is that Detective Hoppy seated right here? Yes. Okay. What's the date? September 19th, 2019. September 19th of 2019. Do you remember being asked questions by Attorney Kugler if that email prompted you to send things for testing to NMS Labs? Yes. If I told you that all the testing of the fragments were done by May of 2019, does that sound correct? Yes. If I told you the final toxicology results from NMS were sent to you in August of 2019, does that sound correct? Yes. So when it was suggested that an email from Detective Hoppy prompted you to do all kinds of, of testing. That's not true, is it? It's not true. Okay. In fact, that email seems to suggest that at a point in time you wanted to see police reports in this case, right? Yes. Why do you want to look at police reports in, before you finalize your determinations in a case? So, and it's, this is practice for all cases. Before, when a case is pending, which means that the cause of death is not established proximate to the autopsy because it requires additional testing or investigation, we always call the police agency involved to say, this is what my thinking is. Did you find anything out in the course of the investigation that I should know about before I finalize the case? In other words, was there a ring doorbell that they found that showed somebody near a residence? Did they find, have an interview with another person that I didn't know about at the time that I knew about the case. Um, those kinds of, th a cell phone might be downloaded and give more information. That could be for time of death. So there's a lot of things that police do later that I, they don't routinely report to me. I mean, you know, I have to ask and say, did you get more information? I might want to know. That's the point of it. Does it appear that that is the topic of the email sent by Detective Hoppy to you? Well, it's his interpretation of what he thought I would know. But the call was, you know, is your investigation done? What do you think might have a bearing? I mean, I ask in general. I, I just, I don't say, tell me about X. I say, what, you know, what did you show that I might find important that might affect um, how I'm looking at the case? Additional evidence. Did Detective Hoppy give you some bullet points about what that those circumstances were that he was aware of? Yes. Did one of those include the defendant admitting to him that she gave Ms. Hernan tetrahydrazoline? Yes. Okay. I want to ask you about the toxicology. <coughs> you were asked a lot of questions about different um, components, substances within the toxicology. So if we could please bring up Exhibit 35. I'd like to have this published to the jury. And before we dive into this a little bit, not too much, I promise. You were asked questions about when medications were discontinued by doctors for Ms. Hernan. Do you remember those questions? Yes. What would you say was, for the majority of those occasions, the reason that medication was discontinued? What prompted it? Um, Speculation. Uh, sustained as to the form of the question. 
you reviewed all Ms. Hernan's medical records that you requested for this case, right? Yes. Did those records reflect medications being discontinued? Yes. Did the records include reasons why they were discontinued? Yes. What were they? Um, I recall that uh, Lynn said that the baclofen um, gave her a rash. Overruled. Go ahead. The medical records indicated that Lynn reported that baclofen gave her a rash, so that was discontinued. Lynn reported that cyclobenzaprine made her gain weight, so that was discontinued. Lynn reported that the Butrans patch didn't work and didn't stick, so that was discontinued. Um, Desipramine gave her a headache, so that was discontinued. So I think I referred to this yesterday as a pattern of her trying things, and you know they weren't working out, so new things were prescribed. Specifically, when the jury looks at page one of Exhibit 35, and if we could zoom in a bit, please, the first series of entries are from iliac blood. Is that right? Yes. Okay. Is a concentration, like let's use for example tetrahydrazoline, it says 160, yes. right? NG per ml? Yes. And that's in the iliac blood? Yes. If you tested for a tetrahydrazoline concentration in urine, would it be 160, the same as what the iliac report was? Object to speculation. She testified she doesn't know what those levels overruled. She may answer. Maybe that was a bad question. Is it is it fair to equate a result of any substance from iliac blood and urine as being equivalent ratios? No, you can't do that. Okay, so when Ms. Kukler asked you about a report that you included in your literature that had thousands of nanograms per mil of tetrahydrazoline, and you said, well, that's in urine. Do you remember that? Yes. So can you really compare a, a number like that to a number from iliac blood? No, you can't compare urine and blood. Blood is circulating, and it's at the moment. Urine is a reservoir. You're continually excreting. So, you know, you really, it's not one-to-one -one by any means. Okay. Now, if we could please go to page four of Exhibit 35. You were asked questions about Alprazolam. You remember that? Yes. And in this case, the iliac blood for Ms. Hernan for Alprazolam was 67. And you were asked a lot of questions about the information that NMS included in their report about Alprazolam. Do you remember those questions? Yes. Did you ask NMS labs to include that piece for you in this literature? No, it's standard on their reports for everybody. Okay. Specifically, you were asked to read about toxic levels. Do you remember those questions? Yes. And you were asked about toxic levels as it relates to a few different substances that were in the tox in this case, right? Yes. Does toxic mean fatal? No. Could you please explain that to the jury? Toxic means that um, at levels that are labeled toxic adverse effects would be more likely. Fatal levels are the cases that we know about in which fatalities have occurred. And in some cases, it's not clear how those reports reflect or do not reflect other ingested substances. In other words, you have to read very closely on reports of case reports that a certain drug was a certain level but X, Y, and Z drug was also there, or this drug was at a certain level, but it was the only compound found. So, I mean, that's, we have to, we take the data from case reports because you can't do studies about certain things in, in living people. Underneath bullet point five on this page for alprazolam, in one of those paragraphs, does it talk about fatalities from alprazolam overdose? Yes. What were the iliac blood levels for the fatalities? What was the range? Well, it says blood level, so I don't even know if it's iliac blood. It could be cardiac blood. But blood levels of alprazolam and alprazolam-related fatalities really, uh, range from 100 to 400 nanograms per mil. In, com 
Okay, that's what it says. And was Ms. Hernan's much, much, much lower than that? If we can scroll to page one, please. Yeah. It was 67. Okay. You were asked questions about the problems of combining something like alprazolam with alcohol. Do you remember those questions? Yes. And you were specifically asked whether Ms. Hernan had ethanol in her stomach. Do you remember that? Yes. Did Ms. Hernan have any ethanol in her blood? No. Based on the toxicology in this case, would you say that Ms. Hernan was intoxicated by alcohol at the time of her death? No. How would you explain, and if you could maybe make a mark on your screen where that ethanol result is that was being referred to by the defense? It says 263, but what fluid was that in? The stomach fluid, gastric. So how did that get there? Do you know what it is from? Yes. Um, it's from decomposition and bacterial activity. Uh, ethanol can actually be an artifact of decomposition in blood, but in something like the stomach, it's even more likely as, it, as uh, the tissue is as the specimen is stored and uh, bacterial activity occurs. So, um, okay. So if a suggestion was made that close in time to death, Ms. Hernan was drinking alcohol and taking alprazolam, would you agree with that? No. Okay. I'd like to go to, please, page 5 of Exhibit 35, and the first entry there being baclofen at the top. Uh, I just want to ask you, again, there was some discussion about a toxic versus fatal level, but in fact, there is some examples of fatal levels of baclofen in this information, isn't there? Yes. And what are those ranges or level? Uh, the two examples um, that were shown, well, actually, it's only one example. A fatality contribu attributed to baclofen was a concentration of 17 micrograms per mil in the blood. 17? Yes. What was Ms. Hernan's concentration in blood? 1.1. 1 1.1? 1. 1. 1. Yes. Okay. <clears throat> if we could please go to page 7 of this exhibit, I'd like to ask you some questions about nifedipine. Is that also listed in the information you got from NMS labs? Yes. And was there nifedipine in Ms. Hernan's iliac blood? Yes. Okay. Is that something that you included in other significant conditions in this case? No. Why? Uh, nifedipine um, is not a primary CNS um, actor. It affects your blood pressure, and it was at a subtherapeutic dose. So I didn't feel that it was a significant contributing condition, which is what the title of that section of the death certificate is, significant contributing condition um, to her death. What is the information regarding fatalities caused by nifedipine in terms of the blood level? In two fatalities associated with the compound, postmortem blood concentrations as low as 150 in nanograms per mil have been reported. 150? Yes. And what was Ms. Hernan's? If we can go to page one. Twenty-two. Okay. While we're on page one, what was the level in Ms. Hernan's iliac blood of hydrocodone? 15. And you testified that hydrocodone is an opiate, right? Yes. And can it be dangerous? Yes. Have you seen cases of overdose from hydrocodone before? Yes. Is that hydrocodone level dangerously high? No. It is, is it even reaching a toxic level? Not by itself. Okay, if we could please go to page six of this exhibit. Uh, similarly, doctors, their information here regarding hydrocodone in terms of fatalities associated with that substance. Yes. And what is that range? In reported overdosage, postmortem blood levels ranged from 130 to 7,000 nanograms per ml. And Ms. Hernan was 15? Yes. Okay.
Moving to a different topic, I am not going to um, go in deeply into these medical records, but I do you recall a series of questions as you were asked to go line by line through some records and why things weren't in the exhibit you created? Yes. If we could please put exhibit 210 up um, just so that we have a reference. Could we unpublish, please? Thank you. <clears throat> and doctor, for example, I think you were asked why you didn't include information about Ms. Hearn's father's prescription history. Do you remember that? Yes. And you didn't put that in Exhibit 210, right? That's correct. Okay. Can you please remind the jury why you made Exhibit 210? And we're ready to publish, Madam Clerk. Thank you. I did it um, to make it chronological by healthcare provider because otherwise the records were um, sequestered by provider. And then this way they're more integrated, you know, where she went and went. And I wanted to um, follow the weights because that seemed to be something that um, I was asked a lot of questions about, so I put it down. Um, I wanted to put down the reason. Under reason, it was, so the reason is not part of the history. In other words, the reason is what the medical assistant wrote, like patient in for med refill. There might be a lot of other complaints, but it was just like, what's the main reason that she came in? Um, so actually, I was trying to do a chronology, and I was trying to create some, um, what do you call it, memory cues for myself, because that was a lot of records. And I wanted to try and, and organize it so that um, I could rely on something uh, to explain it to you. Okay. And... Occasionally in Exhibit 210, are, have you put yourself some notes in there about depression? Yes. Okay. Is it true that if you look at a medical record, a history is kind of repeated over and over again? That's true. When you created Exhibit 210, did you include things that were reported long ago and, and included with the history? No. What was your goal and what you were adding to this exhibit? what her current complaints were and what the current uh, evaluation of the health care provider um, stated. Okay. If I can, I'd like to show um, Exhibit 540, Defense Exhibit 540, page 24, just to the witness. We don't need to publish it. Dr. Bedritsky, you remember being asked a couple questions about back pain today? Yes. Okay. On this page of those uh, medical records, is there an entry regarding when the onset of that back pain issue began for Ms. Hernan? 1991. Okay. Fair to say that appeared to be an ongoing issue for Ms. Hernan? Yes. Okay. You were asked a lot of questions about the dangerousness of using an opiate and a benzodiazepine. Do you remember those questions? Yes. And really you were questioned, how in the world could you not have determined that was the cause of death here, right? Yes. Were you concerned that both of those substances were in the toxicology? Well, I certainly evaluated their levels. Did that cause Lynn Hernan's death? No. <clears throat> were those levels remarkable? They were therapeutic to lower than usual, I would say. What if, well, you don't know what the two pills in the colon were, right? I don't. But what if one of them was hydrocodone? Could that totally change your whole analysis here? No. Can you explain why not to the jury, please? Well, it, because if it's in the colon, then whatever was the pill is likely in her system because it's already gone through a GI tract. So whatever's in her blood would be what I'd be looking at. Okay. So once it's gotten there, it would be shown on the tax for the iliac blood report? Yes. Okay. There was a 
discussion of the palliative care consult that Ms. Hernan got when she was in the hospital, right? Yes. And ultimately, did that team think she needed their services? No, they signed off. Okay. The defense asked you how it could have taken you a year to come to your conclusions in this case. Yes. Did you say that's longer than normal? Absolutely. Was there a reason behind that? It's a serious case. I, I really tried to make sure that I considered all that I could consider, and the last toxicology um, result only came in in August. You were asked about having specific training in THZ poisoning. Do you remember those questions? Yes. And you don't have any? No. Okay. Do you have any as you sit here today? Self-trained. From this case? Yes. Okay. The Why is there no medical literature about where we've dosed people with oral tetrahydrosoline and then taken levels so that, so that that's in the literature available? Uh, it's too dangerous. Why? Because of the effects it has on the body. I mean, that's not, uh, that would never be an approved study. You were asked some questions about the two suicidal cases of drinking tetrahydrosoline that you included in um, your research exhibit. Do you remember that? Yes. And did both of those people survive? Yes. Could you give the jury one example of a main difference between those two patients and Ms. Hernan? The two patients that survived um, were in the hospital. They received treatment for their poisoning. You were asked about vitreous testing. What is that? Uh, vitreous is the clear fluid in your eye. Um, we take it at autopsy. We can do some testing with it. Um, and you, you didn't do that in this case? Why not? I believe I even talked to the people at NMS about it. And the purpose of testing the gastric and the liver was to confirm the presence of tetrahydrosoline. It's difficult to know what those levels mean because we don't have standards, but it's very important. I mean, from, from my point of view, if you find something abnormal on a first series of tests, testing another matrix is a way to confirm it. So I tested two other matrices. I didn't know what the results would be. I didn't know if it would be helpful in understanding what happened, but I thought it would be good to look at. When you test vitreous, Vitreous is like um, serum or plasma in most cases, and, and we know that from um, testing cocaine, for example, in vitreous, but uh, there's no um, literature about vitreous. I could have tested vitreous. I guess I decided that um, I tested enough matrices and it wouldn't add further information. Just a few more questions, Dr. Bedritsky. I'm going to put on the screen for everyone to see Exhibit 34. That's your autopsy protocol. Specifically, you were asked about these two sections that indicate amended on there, right? Yes. Anything remarkable in those systems of Ms. Hernan's body? No. Anything in those two sections that influence your decision in terms of cause or manner of death? No. Did you just make up the information that's in those sections this year? No. Okay. And, and I guess I want to point out that by February of 2023, many people read that report and nobody noticed that they were missing. Um, I only noticed like my third or fourth or fifth reading of the autopsy report and um, I looked back and I said, I signed this out before I completed all the sections, so I had notes. I inserted the proper um, information and it got amended. If we could please go to page one of this exhibit. 
Dr. Bedritsky, can you please remind the jury of what your conclusions in this case were? We can scroll down a bit. That Lynn Hernan died as a result of tetrahydrazoline poisoning. There were other significant conditions, including the use of baclofen, ropinirol, alprazolam, hydrocodone, and cyclobenzaprine. Also, uh, the natural diseases of interstitial myocarditis, hypertension, hepatic steatosis, and chronic obstructive pulmonary disease. What about the manner of death in this case? It's homicide. What does that mean? That means that somebody else administered tetrahydrazoline to her. That's all I have. Thank you, doctor. Thank you, doctor. You may step down. Judge, no. I would like to ask a few follow-ups. No. You may step down. I'll make a record after. Well, ladies and gentlemen of the jury, I need to read the instruction to you. Please be patient. I know you have had a long day. Uh, do not begin your deliberations and discussion of the case until all the evidence is presented and I have instructed you on the law. Do not discuss this case among yourselves or with anyone else until your final deliberations in the jury room. This order is not limited to face-to-face -face conversations. It also extends to all forms of electronic communications. Do not use any electronic devices such as a mobile phone or computer, text or instant messaging, or social networking sites to send or receive any information about this case or your experience as a juror. We will stop or recess from time to time during the trial. You may be excused from the courtroom when it is necessary for me to hear legal arguments from the lawyers. If you come in contact with the parties, lawyers, or witnesses, do not speak with them. For their part, the parties, lawyers, and witnesses will not contact or speak with the jurors. Do not listen to any conversations about this case. Do not research any information that you personally think might be helpful to you in understanding the issues presented. Do not investigate this case on your own or visit the scene, either in person or by any electronic means. Do not read any newspaper reports or listen to any news reports on radio, television, over the internet, or any other electronic application or tool about this trial. Do not consult dictionaries, computers, electronic applications, social media, the internet, or other reference materials for additional information. Do not seek information regarding the public records of any party or witness in this case. Any information you obtain outside the courtroom could be misleading, inaccurate, or incomplete. Relying on this information is unfair because the parties would not have the opportunity to refute, explain, or correct it. Do not communicate with anyone about this trial or your experience as a juror while you are serving on this jury. Do not use a computer, cell phone, or other electronic device, including personal wearable electronics applications or tools with communication capabilities to share information about this case. For example, do not communicate by telephone, blog post, email, text message, instant message, social media post, or in any other way on or off the computer. Do not permit anyone to communicate with you about this matter, either in person, electronically, or by any other means. If anyone does so despite your telling them not to, you should report that to me. I appreciate that it is tempting when you go home in the evening to discuss this case with another member of your household, but you may not do so. This case must be decided by you, the jurors, based on the evidence presented in the courtroom. People not serving on this jury have not heard the evidence, and it is improper for them to influence your deliberations and decision in this case. After this trial is completed, you are free to communicate with anyone in any manner. These rules are intended to assure that jurors remain impartial throughout the trial. If any juror has reason to believe that another juror has violated these rules, you should report that to me. If jurors do not comply with these rules, it could result in a new trial involving additional time and significant expense to the parties and the taxpayers. You are to decide the case solely on the evidence offered and received at trial. With that, you are excused for the evening. We'll get that later. Thank you. Um, have a good evening. We'll see you tomorrow morning. You sure have all your personal items. Eight thirty.
I just took it. Okay. Well, no, I need 589. Oh, hold on. Sure, no problem. Thank you. Be seated. Attorney Kukler, I denied your request under 90611. This witness was on the witness stand today for cross-examination starting at approximately 830 until a little afternoon. We recommenced about 145, and it was only at 4 p.m. that the state started their cross-exam it probably took me five minutes or so to read through that last uh, instruction that I gave. Uh, so the state uh, had about 50 minutes of redirect. Um, and that is certainly commensurate, if not uh, minimal, in relation to the amount of cross that was done today. And in my discretion, there was ample opportunity to ask any question that you wanted to ask I'm, and uh, we're, I'm not, was not going to engage in a back and forth and open that up. Nothing the state questioned this witness about. Open the door. It was all proper uh, redirect. So that is why under 90611, I did not grant that request. Um, frankly, I anticipated it, so I was making some notes. Um, with that, I trust Dr. Kasinko is our next witness tomorrow morning. We'll get started at 8.30. I don't know if we'll get through anyone else, but do you have anyone else um, anticipated in case we get done with her? We will be ready to go with someone else. I know that there's much shorter witnesses that we've asked to be available if we have time. All right, and you'll share that with the defense. Sure. All right, anything else from the state? I would just ask if we could get the bag that those meds were in. I think we need to keep it all together. The, the paper, paper bag? bag? Yes. Yes, That's I would all agree. Got. Anything else from the defense? No. All right, thank you, everyone. We are in recess. We'll see everyone tomorrow.